All right, we are going to start with county, and I would like to open the June 27th county commissioners meeting. Uh, we have announcements. Just one announcement that this meeting is being video and audio recorded. Is there any public comment? Hearing none, is there any new business? Hearing none, we'll move on to the approval of minutes and warrants. I move approval. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 And moving on now to official business, planning office request for execution of quick claim deed from county to town for parcel of land on Heller's Way. Are there any questions? No. No. Nope. Motion to approve. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Uh, moving on to public hearings, we have three different items, um, and they're hearings to consider the taking of permanent easements over certain lands for purposes for which public ways are used in Nantucket. Uh, you just need to open the public. Oh, open the public. I'd like to open the public hearing uh, for item A which is uh, a permanent sidewalk easement over the portion of lot one lying between the face of the building at 20 Straight Wharf and sideline of lot 20 and the portion of lot 20 measuring about 14 feet wide and 44 feet long. Hello, Madam Chairman and board. Um, uh, this um, is an item that has been, um, I think, discussed by you all for quite some time. It's uh, included a discussion in our staff report. It's uh, a real anomaly here where this particular area sticks out into the public way. Um, I know that uh, the board has had several discussions about wanting to proceed ahead with this. Um, and like this hearing, like the others that are before you tonight are road related hearings. So if there are objections to this, there will need to be a second hearing so uh, just keep that in mind in your deliberations. Um, I think this was uh, intended to be the first meeting uh, and that there would in fact be a follow-up meeting later to uh, have a discussion. Um, I know the property owner is here. Um, uh, so I'll let you get on with that. So you just clarify what you meant by if there are objections and this is a road take just so for so that the folks at home and the audience understands that process sure so uh in other eminent domain takings that are not related to uh, road matters for example when we do open space takings and other things there's not a requirement for a second hearing here this is a taking related to road purposes and again town council is here to give you the specific sites if you need it but basically um if there is an objection to any of these three takings that are coming up. So this one, Amelia Drive and Pinecrest, there is a statutory requirement for a second hearing at a later time. And that will be advertised and, and scheduled um, in co consultation with town council and town administration. Thank you. Thank you. Is there any comment from the public? Madam Chair, Sarah Alger um, for the property owner, 20 Straight Wharf LLC. I just want to ask just procedurally, are you doing people in favor and then people in opposition, or are you just opening it up in general? Because I want to speak in opposition. Uh, my plan was to open it up generally. Okay, that's fine. Okay. Well, so I'm speaking in, in opposition. And to start, I just wanted to provide you with these photographs um, just to give you a reminder of the before and after of 20 Straight Wharf. Basically, there are two things at work here. Um, first, I just want to mention, you know, the eminent domain power that you have is a very powerful tool. And you're taking someone's property rights away from them and property that they feel very strongly about. So, and the property owner has very little recourse in, a, in an eminent domain taking. Their, their rights really are mostly to get some sort of damage award when all is said and done. Because of that, we hope that you will use this power wisely and judiciously and, and in a fair manner. And secondly, and sort of tangentially, just the way that 
businesses seem to be being treated in town at the moment. Um, people who come here and invest in the community, and particularly in town, seems to be slightly hostile um, and unwelcoming at the moment. And I, I'm not sure where that's coming from and why that is. And I don't think it should be the case. But I just want to give you a little history of, of how we got to where we are tonight, because there was something in the packet that, that made me think that there's been kind of a disconnect here. So June 5, 2012, um, my client, Bernard Chu, who's here to answer any questions you might have tonight, bought this property and undertook a significant and substantial renovation. Um, he invested a lot of money into this property. He cares very, very deeply about it. And as part of that renovation and making this investment in the community, he voluntarily removed the staircase that you see in the before pictures um, without any request from the town, without any attempt to, to build back out over his property. I know that everyone felt that that was the sidewalk, but there's never been, until tonight anyway, a taking of that sidewalk. So he could have rebuilt his property really up to, up to his property line in a zero front yard setback situation. He opted not to do that because he, I think he wanted, to be a good, he wanted to be a good community member. Um, there was never any sort of acknowledgement or recognition on anyone's part that he did that which I think is kind of a missed opportunity. Shortly after that, I happened to be at a meeting of the Board of Selectmen, and it was brought up, although it wasn't on the agenda, you know, what are we going to do about taking away those parking spaces now that Toby Lest's family doesn't own this property anymore? And it was quickly kind of moved over, but it made me realize, well, so while Mr. Lest's family owned this property, everyone was willing to let these spaces and, and situation with the sidewalk continue. But as soon as someone like Mr. Chu comes in, it's suddenly a different story. In December, December 16, 2015, at the select board um, meeting, the select board met an executive session, which I think is the first time that these takings, at least to my knowledge, were discussed. Nothing came of that. We were kind of wondering what was going to happen. Nothing came of that until around June 23rd, 2017, when we received a letter from the town manager. After receiving that letter, we made several attempts to get a meeting with the Board of Selectmen to discuss this. Um, first, July 24th, then again, August 31st, and then finally, September 8th. Um, we were never able to get a meeting together, and one of the things we were told is that there was no appraisal, and therefore it was not appropriate to be meeting with us. Finally, around November 13, 2017, we were finally able to have a meeting with the town manager, the planning director, my client, and town council Vicki Marsh was on the telephone. Um, we had a very cordial meeting. Mr. Chu indicated that he did not want to fight with the town, that he wanted to work with the town to try to come up with a solution. He proposed um, swapping spaces, giving up the sidewalk and the spaces here in exchange for spaces somewhere else. Um, no other proposal was made or received. Um, everyone went away, and we expected to hear something back. Around December 3rd, 2017, I heard informally that the select board had met and was um, not interested in either working with Mr. Chu or meeting with us and that our proposal had been unacceptable and that there was no forthcoming proposal in response and that we would be receiving a formal letter advising us of the results. We never received any letter. We followed up a number of times. Um, we never had, you know, no appraisal, no offer of compensation or no alternate, no alternate proposal. In the late winter, early spring, and I'm not sure exactly what dates this happened, um, Mr. Vorce was in contact again to see if Mr. Chu would voluntarily allow the sidewalk widening to proceed because it was starting at the easy street end and progressing up Straight Wharf. Unfortunately, we couldn't agree to that because the sidewalk widening was widening into the parking spaces and without 
some sort of resolution on the parking spaces, we couldn't allow the sidewalk widening to go forward. We didn't hear anything else until sometime around the end of May, beginning of June, when I heard from Mr. Vorce again saying that a taking would be scheduled and that we'd get notice in the mail. I guess that's the formal response from our meeting in November of 2017. That formal notice of this week's meeting was mailed on the 14th and received on the 19th. So when I open the packet and I see an indication negotiations with him, presumably Mr. Chu, were not productive, I was kind of disheartened because I thought, well, no, they weren't productive, but we tried to make them productive. We really did try to make them productive, and we got really nothing back. Um, I think we made every effort to try to at least attempt to meet with the town and to work to find a solution. So we're here. Um, there's still no appraisal. The only suggestion we've had coming from the town was the suggestion in the town manager's original letter um, almost a year ago, suggesting that he might want to voluntarily release his rights. Um, and of course, he doesn't, but he does still want to work with you. But I do have some specific objections that I just want to make you aware of um, before I turn this over to him to let him talk to you about what he'd like to propose. First of all, there's no, there's no formal plan of the areas being taken. The notice that was sent references taking an easement over the portion of lot one lying between the face of the building at 20 Straight Wharf and the sideline of lot 20 but it doesn't reference a plan. And the only plan that was referenced in the notice, which was Landcorp Plan 10222E, is not a plan of 20 Straight Wharf. It's a plan of adjacent properties and where, yeah, that's the plan, and where 20 Straight Wharf is shown on that property, on that plan, there's no building depicted. I'm not aware of any record plan that shows the current building face on 20 Straight Wharf. I see in the packet that you do have a copy of the as-built plan from the building department, but that's not sufficient for a taking. It's just what it says it is. It was an as-built plan used for the purposes of getting a CO. Um, and I don't think the taking area is dimensioned or, or shown in any way. The other issue with the notice is that the language in it seems to be somewhat garbled. It starts out by saying that it's a, a sidewalk easement, but then it references that additional land is being taken. And at the end, it says for all purposes for which public roads are used on Nantucket. So it's not even really clear what land's being taken, what it's being taken for, and what land is being taken for what purpose. I'm guessing, because I kind of know what the goal is, that some of it's supposed to be sidewalk and some of it's supposed to be road, but there's absolutely no way to tell that from either the plans or the notice. The other thing that bothered me is the posted notice of this meeting seems to be in, insufficient, and I wondered if it might not be a violation of the open meeting law. If you look at item 1A of section seven, public hearings of the agenda that was posted, it only references the taking of permanent sidewalk easement but it doesn't make any reference to the public roadway purpose taking, which I think is part of what is intended for where the parking spaces are, at least a portion of the parking spaces on Stray Wharf. So I think the public notice of this meeting is probably flawed. But apart from that, because you can fix all of those things, get a plan, publicly notice it properly, we can come back and do this again. I don't understand how you can be voting on something where you don't know exactly what you're taking, you don't know exactly what you're taking for what purpose, you don't have an appraisal, so you don't know what monies you're committing the county to paying. It just seems premature and that you shouldn't, you shouldn't take a vote at all until A, you know exactly what you're taking and why, and B, you know the potential money that you're opening the town up to having to pay as a damage award. So those are, those are kind of the legal points. I think Mr. Chu would like to talk to you about maybe some other ideas. Thank you, Jeff. 
Thank you. Hi, Commissioner. I'm Bernard Chu. Uh, it's spelled C H I U for those who, who, for you who don't know. Um, I had lived on the island for over 20 years. Uh, and when I purchased the, uh, the, the properties, obviously, the parking is a huge part of the appeal to me. Yeah. <laughs> and you know, I'm here tonight, uh, I'm not here to, uh, to, um, to debate or to ask you uh, how much compensation it should be, this I don't know. Uh, but what I do know is the parking space is very valuable for the space. Uh, and, uh, uh, and it is my entire home, uh, and I come here very often. Yeah. Uh, and uh, I want to be a good community member. Yeah. And I, I certainly understand, uh, and I saw uh, that part of the street has, the, uh, the sidewalk has been enlarged. Yeah. Uh, and there's a, uh, a street that left the way it was. Uh, and, and that was my property. Yeah. And, uh, and, and I think there, uh, there are ways we can find solutions to this without going to this extreme of taking uh, the, uh, the right away from a private owner. Yeah. And I want to work with you. Yeah. And I have, say, I have been saying that for the last uh, two years. And I continue want to work with you. Yeah. And I think the time can go what you want, and I can keep what I want too. Right? Now you can uh, enlarge the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the sidewalk, yeah. and I have no problem with that. But, but next to the sidewalk, there's still plenty of space for my parking. Yeah. And those are my space. Yeah. Let me keep them. Yeah. And if you go back to the, to the road, you look at that. The rest of the road has been enlarged, huh? and there's still plenty of parking there. And as a matter of fact, there's still legal parking for the public. So, so don't take the space away from me in front of my building, because I need that. Uh, uh, those are very important to me. Yeah. And I pray as I get older, I don't want to be driving around two hours in town to look for space. But those are my space. Yeah. And I can give you a sidewalk, no problem. Take it. Yeah. And I'm not even asking for compensation for that. Yeah. But please consider uh, what's important to me. And, and also consider what's important to you. Yeah. And I'm happy to find happy media for everybody. Body. And there's, there's really no reason for us to fight here. Great. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, yeah. Is there any other comment from the public? And I'm, I'm not sure, Andrew, if there's anything to clarify or response or if that's done now or after it's closed. That's closed. Well, so, uh, we're not going to. Well, I think close. the comments from council may inform or create other responses from the um, owner's council. So I'd, I'd personally like to hear from town council mm -hmm. because there's some statements of fact that have been offered, and I'd like to know the town council's position on that. Hi, thank you, Marsh. Um, I participated in the conversation with um, Mr. Chu, and, I mean, with um, Sarah Alger and Libby, and Libby Gibson, the town manager, and with Andrew. Um, we did at the time um, listen to their concerns about the parking space. There was some question about um, the title to this property, whether it, the easements, um, with the parking spaces are easements, or whether they were... Um, uh, title and fee to this space. And at the time, um, we had not completed our um, title work on this. Um, we did complete it after um, our conversations, and it was our opinion that um, the research that had been done showed that these were easements and not fee title. Um, in discussing this further with um, Sarah Alchar, um, you know, she felt that she was of the opinion that um, these spaces were um, in a fee and therefore may be worth more money in compensation to Mr. Chu than if they were just easements um, that would be taken. So we have engaged um, to go back and do some additional title work um, and it has not been completed yet, but it will be. And um, 
So that's one issue as far as the title to this property. The other thing is the appraisal. Originally, the appraisal to this property was done on the basis of the fact that it was an easement. Um, again, we were running on the, um, on the concept that the parking spaces were easements in straight wharf and not fee title. Um, so we did receive um, an appraisal, I believe the town did receive an appraisal for an easement value. Um, and then we've gone back to the appraiser subsequently, and I believe we're waiting for his report on the um, uh, appraised value if it was in fee. Um, so it's my understanding that um, the director of planning decided to proceed um, with this um, preliminary hearing to be able to um, see if there were any objections to this taking. Um, I can't speak to the notice that was posted because unfortunately I, I wasn't um, a party to it um, and I did not review the notice, but I, um, if, if Ms. Alger's you know, references to the deficiencies in the notice are correct, um, I certainly would be willing to take a look at it and, and um, see if her opinions are, are valid. Um, and if so, we may need to um, we post this hearing, um, depending upon what I find. Um, but that being said, it goes back to the fact that um, I think that there needs to be discussions, perhaps, between the town and Mr. Chu once we've determined the title status and the value to this property that we would be offering as damages in the event that the town, in the event that the county voted to actually take a sidewalk easement and the spaces. Um, any questions? Uh, just do we? Um, I mean, to me, we interesting to know if it's if we're asking for a taking of an easement or fee ti fee title before we because we're now it says the taking of an easement, doesn't it? Right. So how we, do we? The town, right? I, I mean, it was uh, the, it was our opinion that this was um, a um, an easement. However. You know, we have gone back and done some additional research, and it hasn't been completed yet. I okay, so it may be report. premature. Perhaps, okay. yes. Okay, all right. So, um, I stand corrected. The director of planning said that he, they, the county intends to take um, what would be a, an easement and not the fee in the parking spaces. Okay. I have a process question. So if, if there's an objection, we have to do a second hearing. Correct. But if there was an, if it was the open meeting law violation or it wasn't clear, do we have to redo this hearing? And Correct. Then go through another second hearing possibly? Correct. So, okay. Thank you. We would need to repost, okay. you know, to conform with the requirements um, for the advertisement. Yes. Thank you. Any more? No, thank you. Thank you. Any more comments from the public? Seeing none, I will close the public hearing. Um, in terms of, we have to verify the open meeting law violation first. Correct. And is it then inappropriate to have any discussion now? Or? Uh, I don't think so. Okay. So is there any discussion amongst the board? Do we have the discussion if we think there's an open meeting law violation? No, so we can't. We can't. So I don't. Okay. I think we should then discuss. Okay. Perfect. Personally, Thank you. table it. Yeah. We, we need a motion to table it. Or... Well, no. no matter, no matter what, if there was no open meeting law violation, there'll be a second hearing. Okay. Um, so we, you would have. You don't need to table it because they well, this may, the. Well, it may be a third hearing. Is what we're saying. No, no, I know, but yeah. you don't have to table it because you've already closed the public hearing. So a new one, no matter what. Oh, in terms of the. Okay. So, so I guess we just take no action? Take no action, yeah. yeah. Okay. We'll uh, verify the open meeting law violation. Okay. Right. The next one? Yeah. In my, in my notes, in my apology for not responding, all that's going to be saved for later? <laughs> Darn. I was going to sound really intelligent, too. <laughs> try and save it for later. I was going to try to. Okay, so moving on to B. Um, in relation to the entire private way known as Amelia Drive between the sideline of Old South Road to the sideline of Tacoma Way. Andrew, do you, I'd like to open the public meeting, public hearing. Thank you, Madam Chair. So uh, on this, I think you're all familiar with this particular way, which runs between Old South Road and Tacoma Way. 
Um, this has been a street that's been on the um, right of way committee's list for a number of years as uh, identified in the report. Um, this, uh, again, is intended to uh, get any public testimony if there is any for this. And if there are objections, which we don't have any record of at this moment, we would, we would schedule a second hearing at a later time. In the event that there are no objections, we would like you to continue this matter so final uh, documents would be put together. Thank you. Thank you. Is there any comment from the public? Hearing none, uh, close before continue. Um, no, if you're going to continue the public hearing, you have to just do it to a date certain. So the planning director should give you an idea of when it should be continued to. But can we, we can discuss it before we... I, I want to, I mean, you've closed the public hearing. Not yet. No. I was okay. asking. You're not going to. Okay. Yeah. All right. uh, but did you want to do it? No, go ahead. So we would suggest uh, continuing this to your September real estate meeting. Okay. Thank you. And I, I, I'd just be interested again for the public to have Andrew just kind of describe what the plan is, why we're doing this, why we think it's a benefit to the community. Um, because I, I personally think it's a good idea. So. Sure. Good. No, sure. Thank you, Mr. Kelly. Um, so again, I think you're familiar with this particular area. I think this road has been a, in existence for some time. It, um, when it was originally approved, wasn't clear that this area, what, what it would be when it was finalized. It was in a mixed commercial area, the RC2 zoning district. So it wasn't clear, was it going to be residential? Was it going to be commercial? I think, as you know, it's developed out in, as a commercial area and is now in a commercial district. So the town, I'm sure Libby's office, other public offices have fielded complaints about this, this particular road for a long time. There's um, on-street parking that occurs. There's been um, blockage of the road. I think most people look at this and assume it's a public road, that it's you know, it's paved, it is, is now, a, you know, a connector. So for some time, at least at discussion levels at the planning board and others, there's been, and as I said, right away committee has uh, asked that this become part of the public road network. Um, so finally, we got to a point where one of the applicants, um, which was the mar market at the corner of Old South Road and as part of their special permit, they provided a $10,000, um, um, I guess, <laughs> gift account to create the plan that was done, uh, which, you, which you see up there. Um, and once this becomes a public road, we would be requesting that there be some forums to discuss what level of improvement or changes might occur here, um, whether it be, we've, and I've heard all kinds of different opinions from many people about should it be a one way, should it be um, kept as is with better striping, should there be some minor adjustments to the curb in places. So again, we have a pretty detailed plan that shows where all that is. Um, town manager and I have talked about what kind of budgeting we should set aside for this, and we're going to set some meetings up soon with the DPW director as well. So um, that's all to come. Um, and again, before we start spending a lot of resources, we feel it's important to establish it, that it is, in fact, a public way, and then we go from there. Thank you. Thank you. Sure. Yeah. So in September, if it goes through and we take it, then the process starts of all the public outreach and where people can come and give their ideas and there'll be lots of access from the public to weigh in correct after that yep. and this was part of the six fairgrounds overall plan it was included as part of the overall circulation of the area as well that this um that this petition would come forward okay. thank you thanks and i think the six fairgrounds agreement committed us to this okay although this is the first time that we as a board have discussed it so. so with no more public comment at the moment, we'll continue this September 26th. to September 26th. So moved. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Are we going to discuss anything or are we going to wait and discuss it 
September. I would say wait, personally, unless you have. Okay. I bet it's up to. I think if you have comments, that's a long ways away. So if there's something on top of your mind, I'd be open to discussing it now. Right. Okay. I mean, I, I look and I think that it, it's it's. I think we need to have on-street parking on that road, no matter what happens. Uh, I think it should be uh, well designed. There should be ca traffic calming there. Otherwise, if there's no on-street parking, it'll become a raceway and a, a cut through. I think some of the what happens there now is appropriate because it slows people down a little bit. Uh, and I think, so from a good planning perspective, I think a lot of those streets through there should be connected, not cut off. Uh, and then in situations like this, you know, people who have sort of listened to me for a while, I think sometimes betterments are appropriate. I think a lot of these subdivisions, a lot of these things that were built out, you know, sort of, and I pushed hard for uh, out by the airport. So, you know, for that whole Lover's Lane area, a lot of those subdivisions were, you know, sort of, the, the streets weren't done great and they, they didn't last. And, you know, and I feel bad for the neighbors, but the, the price of that was vested in what was done. And so I think the town... If it's going to take things, the town should be, you know, taking them in, in, should be taking them when they're the way the town wants them. You know, so I mean, we'll have that discussion later. I just I want to be think I want us to be thinking about it. I know a lot of people that are there. I've talked to them. A lot of the people, a couple of the people that live there would that would love it widened slightly and in, in the parking to stay because they need it for their businesses. And they wouldn't be at least a couple I've talked to wouldn't be opposed to paying $50 a, a month or a couple hundred dollars a year to improve it. And so I just think we should be thinking about those type of issues as well. If we're gonna fix everything, I don't know where we're gonna, if we're gonna fix everything everywhere, I don't know where the money's gonna come from. So that's just my typical discussion. Thank you. Uh, so with that then we'll move on to item C. Uh, the internal roadways of the so-called Pinecrest Drive subdivision, including an easement. And I'd like to open the public hearing. Hello again. Um, so this um, matter has come before the board again to have at least a, a discussion about the concept here. And this is not there is not a final plan ready for your action, um, but it's it's really a necessary discussion that we need to have before additional work is committed um, of both staff and and others that would look at this. Um, I gave a report uh, in your packet, and hopefully you've had a chance to look at that. Um, this is part of a long-term discussion um, with area residents. It really began back in 2005 with some that are no longer there and some that are here in the room um, to talk about how to deal with probably one of the weirdest and worst divisions of land. No offense to anybody on this, but... There's some really strange lot patterns here that um, started with these 40-foot wide sections in the front that go to these sort of 10-foot strips that go and attach to the back. And that was done at the time, I think, because um, those lots were created through approval not required, which is a, a simpler process than going through a, an actual subdivision. And I think the trade-off, and again, I wasn't here at the time, but I think the trade-off was, in fact, an overall lower density was achieved here. Um, if you look at the history, there was sort of a secondary nosh up that covered parts of this land and, and other land to the west that never happened. Because at the time, there was some sewer, sewer capacity issues were in play. So anyway, the, the, the point here is the layout of the internal roadway network, which follows the existing roadways, um, regularizes um, a situation to a more, I guess, normal layout of roadways. Um, this property is very complex because of the 10-foot strips sort of going through the whole thing. And um, so it's something that the individual neighbors to go through a process would be incredibly difficult and time consuming. I know they've looked into it to see if they could do it themselves. Um, but by the, the town assisting here, um, there's an opportunity, I think, to proactively take some actions here, which meet the neighborhood objectives and the town's objectives as well. And those include extending uh, water and sewer 
into this area without going through individual easements from the adjoining properties um, to uh, over an overall lowering of the, the potential density and build out here that is uh, that was allowed when the property existed in the RC2 district. So as you've heard me talk about the RC2 district is our high, one of our highest density districts. It's 5,000 square feet, 50% ground cover, 40 foot wide lots. And the neighbors worked uh, with me and, and the planning board last year to change the zoning for a significant portion of the interior part of this from R5 to R10. And what that did is it cut the potential ground cover in half from 50 to 25%. It doubled the lot size from five to 10,000. So it, through, through their own sort of actions, it reduced um, the development potential that at least existed at that time. So, um, and, and I think you'll hear from them is they like their area the way it is. They want the qualities there to continue. And um, the fact that they're working with us is actually very positive. So the, the step to lay out the roadways again uh, comes with some other um, agreements that were laid out in the memo. So even though it's a public road, we would enter into, the town would enter into agreements with them to conduct the maintenance so it would not be a cost to maintain the road for the town. There would be um, develop, development restrictions on the interior which effectively lower the density further to uh, roughly R20, which is half acre. So it's gone from one eighth acre to half acre, which is a significant reduction here. Um, and they would, one thing I didn't include in the memo, they would pay for the legal costs because uh, there is quite a bit of uh, work that needs to be done and which will involve our town council here, Vicki, um, to put that together, which would include the town's right to enforce the restrictions and um, the agreements about uh, the roads, et cetera. So that's it in a nutshell. And if you have any questions, let me know. Great, thank you. Is there any public comment? My name is Marianne Hanley. Uh, in my capacity as trustee of October Nominee Trust, I'm the owner of the real property located at 98A Old South Road. Uh, I filed a formal objection to this proposed taking. I believe that this plan that's in front of you, as Andrew said, it's, it's not the final taking plan and it really shouldn't be the subject of a public hearing at this point in view, at this point in time. It's unclear to me that these are in fact roadway easements and if the real issue is water and sewer, perhaps rather than taking roadways, all you need to do is take sewer and water easements. Um, there are a list of con conditions that supposedly the homeowners have agreed to. I have not received any notification about this. The first time I heard about this proposed taking plan was when I opened my mail yesterday, the, uh, Monday afternoon and saw the notice. Uh, I believe that it's, I'm not even sure if legally the, the town can take roadways and still expect the homeowners to maintain them and pay for them. Uh, there's questions in my mind, would there be par you know, public parking on these, on these roadways? We hear all about Uber drivers coming from the Cape and sleeping in their cars at night. And, you know, this might be the new Pinecrest Motel. Um, I'm just very concerned about how this has been presented and what the potential issues are. Uh, there's certain areas where there's that lollipop curve there. I don't know why that's set up the way it is. Is that for parking? Then there's some cross-hatched areas over on the other side of the property. Uh, what, th there's no designation what those are. Um, and as you can see, it's, it was supposed to be some kind of a plan to take land, but it's been crossed out and things have been written in, so it's, it's really quite unclear what's going on. Since I have objected, uh, this certainly will need to continue on to another hearing. And I think it would probably make sense for the homeowners to actually get together with the proponents of the project. Andrew, I'm assuming he knows who they are. I certainly haven't been contacted. And 
I don't have any information. And rather than spend a whole lot more time on this this evening, I would suggest that it simply, after other public comment is made, that it get continued so we can figure out what the heck is going on here. Thank you. Andrew? And, you know, I, I'm, I, I want to just make it clear that I've worked with a group of homeowners and I really did think that everyone was included. So I expressed that to them today that, you know, they appear to have missed um, Ms. Hanley's um, uh, client. So again, this, uh, as I said earlier, um, this was intended to be basically, you know, a neighborhood scale project. And, um, you know, maybe they can, the, the other homeowners can talk about how, unfortunately, that person was missed. But I think um, the particular agreements and everything that we're talking about, again, the intent was to have an initial discussion with the board about the concept and then have the second follow-up meeting that would um, really nail down most of those questions that were, that were raised. Thank you. And, yeah. Hi, my name is Jeff Smith, uh, 98 Old South Road. Uh, I bought into this neighborhood about six years ago, and I've worked constantly with Arthur Reed and um, Dan Malloy to try to figure this out privately. And went into um, Andrew's office quite a bit. Thank you for all your time. Um, there are quite a few members of our neighborhood, um, and I'm not going to say association because there is no association. It's absolutely defunct. Over the last six years, we haven't had any meetings. Um, so, Mary and, you know, uh, your client, Donald, it, there hasn't been, this information has not been disseminated. There's probably 75% of the homeowners here have no idea. You know, I just looked at the plan, this plan, yesterday for the first time. So it would be nice to have a little bit more time. I know this is going to be continued anyway. Um, but we need to get together as an as a association in July or August and um, agree upon something and then bring it back here. But I think this is a really good step in the right direction. Thank you. <laughs> Any further public comment? As there's been two requests to continue, as opposed to the automatic second hearing, is it more appropriate to continue? No. To close. We have an objection, so you have to. So we have to have it, anyways. Okay. So I'll close the public hearing. Is there any discussion now? I just want to kind of try to figure out what we're, what's happening in basic terms. So if this was to go forward, all the details were worked out and all the homeowners were happy, it would lower the amount of ground cover but allow them to build more dwellings. Is that, is that too simple to like, oversimplify it? Taking out RC2. Well, the fact that it already moved out of RC2 has lowered the right. amount of dwellings. The fact that what we're talking about here lowers the amount of dwellings even further because there will be additional restrictions. The, the interior lots that you see that are, that are significantly oversized, again, if someone was motivated to assemble those and you know, create a, a subdivision of some kind, there would be more, um, there would be more capacity within here than what, we're, what we've talked about with the neighbors. So um, the R10 was a, was a first step, which again, uh, cut in half the number of lots and the number of ground cover, or the amount of ground cover that could be built. The, the next step with the neighbors is to work with them to further refine those, um, those restrictions again. And these would be restrictions that the town enforces, not private parties, because as you, I think as you know, many of the private deed restrictions expire after 30 years, and then you just go with the underlying zoning. So we've moved ahead in a number of other neighborhoods that I think probably most of you can remember where deed restrictions were expiring, and we changed the zoning in advance of that. 
So again, this is this is a proactive um, situation, um, and the, and the total number of dwelling units at the end of the day will be less. Now, the the way that lots are currently structured, there's a limit to them because of the odd um, the ten foot strips and sort of the geometry of it all. But one of the lots is actually has frontage in the back on Hinsdale Road, and it's not part of this particular group. That's already been divided under the RC2. So it's, it's already happened, at least in one case. Uh, others, well, that's one, Erica, oh. that's an older one. But if you go to the far western corner at the top, that one there. So again, the rest, the rest of the group is, is willing to work together on the remaining um, properties. Thank you. Thank you. Any other comments or thoughts? Uh, my only comment is um, this is a busy time of year, and I don't know if this is so time sensitive. I would give it as much time as it takes for the consensus to be reached, and if that takes three months, I don't, I don't, I wouldn't object to that. Yeah. Right. I would like to see sort of what what the potential is now under under this zoning versus what it will be under the other thing, just on a on a chart. And I and I you know, I want to commend Andrew because I do think the process that you're using uh, with the individuals and with the neighborhoods has proven to be a positive one. And I think, you know, in this case, but I just want to make sure that we understand what the impact is. And then I will say that this stunt kind of stuff is outlawed now. You can't you know, take a little piece of frontage and drag it out. What were they, pork chop subdivisions? Was that the, that was the name for these back in the day. It was pork chop subdivision. And the, and the idea of it was you had frontage on one road and you'd bring a little line to it and go all the way out to the properties so that you could do it a little more easily. And that is no longer allowed. But you'll still see it if you look, I think it's in Matic at some, you can still find them around. Mm -hmm. Right, and I'd just like to make sure that we uh, make sure that all of the neighbors have been contacted in the end. And if there's any questions, um, Marianne's points about any of the legalities of it, just make sure that we have that set out. Anything else? Okay. Um, moving on to commissioners' reports and comments. None. And is there a motion, motion to, to adjourn? Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, moving on to the select board meeting for June 27th. We'll call to order. We have a couple of changes to the agenda. Um, we're going to table consent item number four and number six. So those are going to be tabled. And we're also going to move the committee reports to the select board. Um, we're going to do that to the end. So uh, you're welcome, everyone. For that uh, we decided to we put this agenda together to put the select board reports and comments at the beginning so we could go over the committee reports and the surfside crossing letter so you didn't have to sit through everything else <coughs> thank you later okay announcements this morning's board meeting is being video and audio recorded we have our second Coastal Resiliency Forum being held on Wednesday, July 18th at 6 p.m. Uh, here in this room. We had a prior one at the end of May, and we hope the public will attend. We have a pond forum we've scheduled. We talked about this a, a month or so ago. That is going to be held on Monday, July 23rd at 5 p.m. in this room. And we're going to be sending out an invite on that shortly. If people are interested in it, we'll have some information on the town website. Town offices are closed next Wednesday, July 4th. The next board meeting after tonight will be Wednesday, July 11th. And then we are into the summer schedule where we meet twice in July, twice in August. Um, DPW director is going to give us a quick overview of a landfill entrance change that is being worked on. I wanted to run it by you all, um, show you quickly before we get too far down the road with it, because it's going to be going into effect fairly soon, within the next couple of weeks. Thank you. Uh, Rob McNeil, DPW. So um, in sort of an answer to thank you, um, the traffic that's uh, backed up fairly regularly during the height of the season out at the Madigan Road, 
Um, we've been looking at several improvements to the operation uh, out at Waste Options, including starting with um, relabeling and reconstituting the chutes for the residential drop-off uh, for recycling products. Uh, but more to traffic, uh, <coughs> felt like adding a, a, th a third lane uh, specific to the scale house would be able to more quickly separate the traffic uh, from one another, the, the commercial scale house traffic from the residential drop-off traffic uh, would, would help eliminate uh, a decent amount of traffic that's now stacking out on the road. In addition to those two changes, uh, we're looking to uh, reverse the circulation of traffic through the parking lot for the residential drop-off, uh, beginning with a left-only turn lane uh, at a stop condition at this location. It would bring folks in, would uh, add formal parking uh, to the left-hand side. We would put a center, uh, essentially a crosswalk location for for everybody that's parked to be able to safely cross uh, to try to centralize that activity. And then what happens by doing that is you end up allowing a, tr a, a decent amount of queuing to occur uh, for people that are waiting for a parking space, uh, essentially u utilizing the site uh, better as opposed to utilizing Madiket Road uh, way out on the street. So these, uh, right now, DPW is working on um, essentially widening the throat from the gate uh, down to the access road to DPW. And uh, we expect that to be paved uh, early next week. Uh, thereafter, people will probably see some cones out there to start looking at uh, sort of training people to get into these locations before the pavement markings go down. And we will, uh, we will start working with the new circulation uh, as soon as we can properly mark it uh, to let people know. So I just wanted to give people a heads up. Uh, there is some accommodations for people that are returning uh, after going over the scale that need to go back over the scale. Uh, those accommodations are being made uh, generally out in this area uh, to try to keep these other areas free of truck traffic as much as possible. So there's changes that are happening. Wanted to let everyone know about it. And uh, it's a work in progress. We just want to keep people posted. Rob, I have one question. Sure. And that, you answered this in a couple of days, but I told people in May, why can't we just shoot, exit people out by take it or leave it right out to Madigan at, at the end of the parking lot? So we're surrounded on this side uh, on two sides by uh, land bank property. So we're not, not the owners there. I got, I got that question a couple times. I think it's helpful. I had a friend tell me how excited he was that you were doing this today. He yeah, said it was, he said it was, oh, uh, good. yeah. <laughs> uh, one last thing, just as far as the recycling goes, uh, I've had a lot of questions recently and uh, the, the, there was a rumor apparently that uh, we were no longer recycling. Uh, that everything was just getting landfilled. So we are, in fact, recycling still. Um, what the combination here is doing is opening up paper, uh, shoots that were dedicated to paper. Uh, the paper market uh, internationally is really in the toilet. So we're repurposing those shoots for uh, what we expect to be a long haul here. Um, so those, by adding... Uh, taking repurposing the paper shoots into cardboard, plastic, and, and tin and aluminum, uh, that allows people to cycle through those areas faster because there's more uh, bins to be able to utilize. So, uh, paper should be included in your regular solid waste, your trash, because it goes through the composter. Okay. Right. The, the only other thing I saw uh, in the a late email today that the haulers are going to be able to go in on the fourth mm -hmm. they will and i think that's amazing and yeah that's great one last thing just to add distinction to plastics uh, i know there's a lot of talk about there about which plastics should i be putting in the plastic bin all of them because they are sorted they're sorted in the facility um the plastics that are recyclable get bailed and get shipped off island 
the plastics that are not recyclable get packaged and put into bulky waste, which becomes, which is sent off island as construction and demolition debris. Very dis, uh, important distinction because it's tons and tons of unrecyclable plastic. If it doesn't go into the plastics and get sorted, it goes into your general trash, it goes into the landfill. So that is not a good thing. We want to make sure all plastics in every form go into the plastic bins. What about compostable plastics? <laughs> that is compostable. But when it's, it's not plastic, it's corn, correct? Some are, some aren't, but yeah. It should be. It should uh, be. You can also check with the manufacturer. Right. Um, there's also, we, we need to understand the composter right. and its abilities a little right. bit more. And we've been, we've been talking to a lot of folks about running some sort of a test or a pilot project to run through what your board has mandated to go to uh, for, for compostable single-use plastics if, in fact, the composter is able to compost them. So that's something that we're uh, hoping to shoot for in the next year. Yeah, I would love to see that. I brought a bunch of them a number of years ago for that test and was told it wasn't possible. But I think it is possible. You know, we can track great whites in the ocean <laughs> with beepers. We should be able to you know, track some sure. compostable plates through the digester. Well, I, think we, I think we have that ability. I'm looking forward to it. The, and the reason I'm asking this is, is the, I've spoken to a lot of the manufacturers of these items. And in other, other uh, communities, if a load of biodegradable has a little bit of oil plastic in it, the load's no good. If a load of oil has some biodegradable in it, it's no good. If you're burning it, you can burn both. But if you're recycling, it makes the entire thing, uh, you know, tarnished. Mm. So I think, I think it is something as we sort of work through this to figure out what's the right way to do it. Definitely. Thank you. Thanks. Is that all of it? Yeah. Did you mention the new business item? Sorry? Did you mention yes. the new? Oh, no, he didn't, but we need to Okay, uh, we're going to move over to public comment. Is there anything you may like to speak today that's not on the agenda? I can do that in public comment. Seeing none, we have a, one item on new business today, a noise bylaw request. I uh, think that's going to be up here. This came in, was it timely to get into the packet? I believe this is something that comes in annually. Make a motion to approve. Okay. Second. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. That was quick. Okay, approval of minutes for June 6th. Do you have a motion? Motion to approve. Second. Second. Okay, approval of payroll warrants and treasury warrants. Motion to approve. Okay, is there a second? Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Pending contracts. Is there any questions from the board? Comments? Seeing none, is there, is there a motion? Oh, I'm sorry. We're we going to get a review of the the CRC oh, contracts. Yeah. Did I ask you to do that, Rachel? Um, uh, a little quick. Uh, or was, I'm sorry. I totally forgot about that. That's okay. Um, we had just more if there were questions. We had just asked about maybe a brief mention on some of the really good human services programs that are going on in the community. Sure. If you um, could touch I thought on the them. Chair Dorothy Hertz might have been here, um, so I don't want to step over her either. Um, not sure why this is. Um, this was a really good cycle. We have a really good group on the contract review committee, and they took a lot of time vetting. Um, so a lot of the concerns and issues that we had in the past were a little bit more in-depth reviewed this cycle. We have a new protocol that went into place to help us address either late contract submissions or amendments that might have gone into play. So um, one that we had was the initial request was much lower. And then through the process and talking with the actual nonprofit group um, was determined that they probably could have asked for more to cover some of the other programming that they were looking at, which they ended up putting an amendment in. Um, so that was a new process for us. So we did um, the board approved a new protocol, which was great. Um, a lot of these are recurring um, programs that we've provided support for in the past. 
Um, and there's a lot more additions that are happening. Um, so health imperatives, for instance, we're adding a lot more programs that are expanding. They've learned that a lot of what they're doing is not reaching the full amount that they could, um, not for any other reason other than staffing or not reaching out to certain populations. So they've added a lot of additional programs that they were requesting funding for. Um, and so other than that, besides um, a few other um, expansions um, with their general programming, uh, everything was kind of about the same that we normally see in the past. Um, there is a little bit of an in take a little bit more of a change, um, for instance, with Fairwinds. So a lot that we provided with behavioral health related services in the past was more to offset costs of low income or people without insurance providing those services. And because they've, like many of the others, have learned to expand their programming, they opened their behavioral um, kind of walk-in clinic and that we were able to change their request to accommodate 50% of the funding is going to helping to support their walk-in clinic, which they think will also field a lot of the intake. And then we're still providing that support to the low income or underinsured individuals. Um, it's just getting filtered through their organization a little bit differently. Um, so unless there are specific questions, I think that ultimately um, <laughs> most of the programming is ultimately the same. Um, again, I know some people always have this question and they may not have been at town meeting, but Martha's Vineyard Community Services is not providing funding from Nantucket to Martha's Vineyard. Um, they are a service that even though that is their name, they do service keep in the other islands. Um, so uh, I just wanted to make that clarification as well, just so that people in the audience might see that and wonder why we're sending money that way. But that's a great service that provides a lot of support to individual families um, and children on the island as well. Um, any specific questions on them? Or um, we've been really good. The other thing that we did this year is I think that um, understanding exactly what's been funding and funded and making sure that it's going towards what the grant applications requested, um, we tightened up that process a little bit as well. So what normally happened in the past is when they provided their quarterly invoice, they gave a quarterly report. Um, it wasn't very well vetted so to speak. It also wasn't um, very detailed or really matched what the request was. Um, so elder services, for example, might have just said, hey, this is how many meals we provided. Um, but they also do so many other things when they're providing those meals. So we really dove into that information. Um, so instead of just saying we did X number of meals at the senior center, we're also wondering how many meals are being delivered to the home through the Meals on Wheels program. And maybe what's, what is then fielding um, you know, elders at risk at home or things like that. So there's a lot of things that even though that's the direct service, there's a lot of um, things embedded in that direct service that aren't really seen in just numbers. Um, so hopefully once we get um, a lot of those quarterly reports that really do tie into the grant request and the grant programming, it'll help with the future years and really understanding exactly what this money is going towards. Um, I, think it's, I think it's great and hopefully we can continue um, to increase what we provide to them. I think we had about $485,000 in requests. So we were almost able to fully fund all the requests that we received. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Before we move off, one other comment. Page 23 is the uh, picture of the Yacht Club. We're doing a license before we get an easement. And I think, uh, you know, I just want to thank, I think we all thank the Yacht Club for working with the town and making the sidewalks uh, possible. They're allowing us to widen the sidewalk onto their property slightly, to add a fire hydrant on their property rather in the middle, rather than in the middle of the sidewalk. And I think it's a good, uh, it's something positive. And I think other uh, businesses downtown, if they have the opportunity, should provide the same benefit because that helps all of us. Uh, and it's it doesn't hurt them. And so I think they were leaders, and I think it's great. If you look at the picture, you know, everyone that's driven down there, that road in that sidewalk is way better. So it's a good collaboration for public benefit. It is. And I think in, in some of the uh, some of the meetings we had, uh, some of the other neighbors on Easy Street were offering similar things, and it came from the individuals themselves. So I think there's a 
you know, good public private to try to improve the downtown. It's great. Thank you, Matt. I just got a note that nobody can hear me in the back. Can, it's on here. Can uh, somebody check? There. Can the control room raise my mic volume? I feel like it's below you. But you, you're supposed to put it below. Checking, checking. Check in, check in. Is that better? That's better. Okay. Now you all can really hear me. Okay, so was there a motion on that for the approval? Motion so moved. Approve. Any second? Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 All right, and motion passes. All right, on the select board reports and comments. So we're going to start with review of preliminary town comments on Surfside Crossing 40B application to the Zoning Board of Appeals. I just want to uh, frame kind of what, how this is going to go tonight so we can be productive as possible and hear as much from the public as possible. Uh, I'd like to start um, talking to Ilana Cork, who's our town council. And this was put on the agenda for the board to talk because we can't talk outside of a, a open session about what should go on this letter, if we want to add anything, if we wanted to uh, edit it, make it stronger, add, you know, and we, we need this, um, this time tonight to talk about it. And so we have town council here to, to start us off. Um, we're going to ask for public comment, limited public, public comment at the end. If everybody can keep it brief, I know there's a lot of people here who want to speak tonight about it, but if you keep it to two or three minutes, just so we can hear from as many as possible. And uh, but really, we put this on the agenda for the board to have a, an open discussion on, on this. So, Lana, could you give us, uh, start us off with, one of my questions is the, the, the purview of the select board here. Uh, I'm, I'm, I, I'm feeling, I, I think we've all heard uh, from the public that they want the select board to do more. And so I think it'll help to clarify what we can do, what we can't do. And uh, what I don't want to do is to step in the uh, statutory shoes of the Zoning Board of Appeals. So I think understanding that process helps everyone. Exactly. Good evening, uh, members of the board. Atlanta Quark, uh, KP Lawtown Council. Uh, you have before you the, uh, the potential comments uh, by the Board of Selectmen to the ZBA for the pending Surfside Commons uh, 40B on South Shore Road. Obviously, this is a project that this board has paid a lot of attention to already. It, you put a lot of time and effort into the original comments that you gave to the project eligibility letter that was applied for by the developer. And so at this point, the public hearing is ongoing before the ZBA. The standard for the ZBA as it moves forward in the public hearing process is to review the application, take in all of the materials, look at everything very carefully, ask for all of the information that it has the ability to ask for, get peer review of it, and then apply the standard, which is to make a determination as to whether the housing need, which is presumed to outweigh um, any uh, local concern because there's not a safe harbor available, but to determine whether there is indeed a local concern that nevertheless outweighs the, uh, the need for housing because of a local concern, because there is a local concern that is so important, health, safety, welfare, uh, and based upon the regulations that apply and that have been sought to be waived, whether there either should be a denial of the project or whether there are conditions, a set of conditions that should be imposed. And so as the ZBA moves forward in the public hearing process, one of the things that is extraordinarily helpful to it and one of the things that it is required to do under the process is to give a copy of all the materials to all of the various town agencies, including this board, so that you can take your expertise about the, the, the community and about this project and make comments. And certainly the basic comments that you likely would make would be based upon the comments that you made to the project eligibility letter. But of course, this evening you're going to hear from the public and see what their specific comments are with regard to, to the project and that will help you as well. I did receive a draft, a very preliminary draft at the end of last week prepared by staff for you. Uh, and I have looked at that, gave some comments back on Monday and asked some questions. And I do want to thank Erica for immediately giving me back uh, the information that I needed, which was the Weston and Sampson report from 2017. I got that, reviewed it. I have some more questions about that. I spoke to the director of planning this evening. I spoke to the fire chief this evening. And there is a call in to, um, to the sewer department as well because there's some technical questions that need to be answered and injected into your, your draft comments. And I know that there may have been a press 
on the part of the board to try to get the comments finished for this evening to get them to the ZBA. However, I understand that the comment period has essentially been extended. The board won't meet again. The ZBA won't meet again until July the 24th. And so the comment period now, I believe, is July the 19th, which I understand will allow you to meet one more, one more time before this evening. So I think that the board can feel comfortable this evening hearing from the public, and certainly I will take you know, copious notes uh, you know, to try to assist with your, with your comment letter. But again, please know that I have seen the preliminary draft, and I'm, I'm working on that within that parameter with regard to some of the basic issues, sewer, um, fire issues, and other public safety issues, water issues, um, conservation issues. So certainly those are all within play, but of course, very important to hear from the public to hear their concerns. So on July 11th, that's when we will we can do some part of this again and finalize the letter. Is that correct? That's the idea. Okay. And we'll get some of those answers that you're in the process. Exactly. Can I just yeah. a quick question before sure. to Alana? Uh, you were talking about local concern. What is the standard for local concern? Well, the first thing that the board does, that the ZBA does, is to look at all of the local requirements, which are the local bylaws, uh, regulations, and rules, and make a determination as to whether the project conforms to all of those requirements and to see what waivers are necessary and whether the waivers requested should be granted or not, or whether it is so important for public safety reasons either for the um, the future occupants of the project or for the residents of the town overall to not grant the waiver. And it's a very high standard. Uh, the burden of proof would be on the board to show in the event of an appeal if they said we deny or we want to impose a condition and, and the applicant came back and said, well, that would render our project uneconomic and there was a review and there was a determination that that would be the case. The standard for proving a local concern exists that outweighs the regional need for affordable housing, that burden would be on the board. And so the question becomes, I think your question is, give an example of what a local concern would be that would outweigh the regional need for affordable that would, housing. Yeah, that, that would meet the standard. That yeah. would meet the standard. That, that, that the state would accept. Exa exactly. So some of the examples, and there are not that many of them, because obviously uh, the presumption is that if you don't have a safe harbor, which one is not in place at this time, there's a heavy presumption that there is not a local concern that outweighs the regional need for affordable housing. But certainly there have been a couple of cases. One, for instance, where there was a very long dead end, like more than a mile, and it was a very dense development, and ultimately it was determined that it was just too long you know, in the event that you had blockages, fire um, issues, which of course are always of paramount importance, were a huge concern. And so that was found to justify you know, denying a project. Other, other types of, of concerns relate to, you know, in the event that there is some, you know, terrible public safety issue that, that, you, that you just can't get there. Now, I can give you an example in the reverse of what was found not to be a, a local concern that outweighed the regional need for affordable housing. There was a situation where uh, the town was able to prove that, well, you know, this project is going to flood, and, and as a result of the flooding, one of the roads in will be blocked during storms and so public safety won't be able to get in that way and the HAC looked at that and said that's true it won't but uh, but there's another way in it will take a lot longer to get there but you'll be able to get there so uh, we, we find that that is not a local concern that outweighs the regional need for affordable housing so my recommendation always within this context is for the ZBA and for all the local agencies that comment on the project to look very carefully at health and safety concerns. You know, certainly the ability, and, and the fire chief has raised a number of issues, you know, the ability to get in and, and to make sure that the models are satisfied, the turning models to make sure that they have the equipment in the event of an emergency can get in and can get around the, the various buildings. Those are very important concerns. And of course, parking is a concern with a, with a heavy development like this. So, and, and the ZBA is certainly, you know, very cognizant of those issues and is paying a lot of attention to those issues and has asked for peer review of all of those issues. But it is certainly extremely helpful and very important for this agency to make those comments and for the public to be heard with regard to those kinds of issues. How, how often in similar type of projects are parking requirements waived? And how does the state generally look upon that? You know, I, I would say that the 
ratio of parking for the vast majority of the developments that I see, the, the ratio is going down, constantly going down, and, and that's being upheld. But it's in a different context than what I see here. This is different than what I normally see. What I normally see is a very large rental project within a, you know, a certain context within a community where there's public transportation and, and, you know, and I know that there is some public transportation that a, a bus line was at, a stop was added not too far and it's apparently year round. So that is of, of some assistance, but still this, this situation given the, the seasonality and, and, and the other unusual and unique situations that you have here uh, on Nantucket need, I think, very specific peer review to make sure that this is, this is safe for everyone. Uh, you know, obviously, there are a number of single-family homes that are, are proposed, I believe 60 of them, but I believe with only two parking spaces each, and some of them will have four and five or more bedrooms. And so, obviously, that's not something that I typically see. I, you know, I do a lot of 40Bs, sometimes three a week, even four a week, uh, but I can't say that I have ever seen one with, with five bedrooms, uh, you know, in, in a single family or, or more. And so obviously the parking issue is going to be very, um, uh, you know, of, of great importance. And the width of the access ways is going to be extremely important because the concern, of course, is if there's on-street parking, what does that do, uh, particularly in the winter months when there's snow, to make sure that there's, you know, ability to get the snow removed, to have, have um, snow areas where the, where the snow will be taken to or that it will, or that it will be removed in, in, um, in an appropriate fashion when necessary. Because, of course, if you already have a narrow road, and someone is parking, you know, a number of people are parking along the road, whether they're guests and so forth, that really hampers the, um, the emergency responses. So that's something that the ZBA has been highlighting uh, with the applicant and, and has asked peer review to highlight. But again, always an important thing for an agency such as this one and, and for the public to make those comments as well. I have not seen a situation where a direct challenge has been made only on the issue of parking, if it were simply parking, it would be difficult to, you know, to deny a project. But here, you know, certainly a condition that the roadway be of a certain width and so forth, that, you know, those certainly would be conditions that, that the ZBA would be, you know, within its purview to consider. And helpful for it to do so with, you know, certainly with the urging and the advice of, of this board and, and of the comments from the public. Elena, I have uh, one question. If you have seen a situation like this where um, environmental concerns have been significant enough to have an impact as a local concern, at lar especially particularly because this is in a wellhead protection zone and a watershed. Uh, the wellhead protection watershed. issue is a critical one, obviously, for this project. And it is beyond really the realm of the overall environmental picture because there are state permits that would be required you know, for that, and so of course those would have to be satisfied. But the wellhead issue is of great concern, and the ZBA has focused on that as well, and is looking for very specific peer review on that. Uh, you know, obviously, the impervious surface requirement uh, is normally I think it's it's 15 percent, but they're looking for you know over 50 percent, you know 48 percent I think overall, and for the condo project it's it's over 50 percent. So, you know, a huge concern obviously. And, and that is something that the ZBA is focusing very heavily on. But again, you know, within your comments, very important f for that to be focused on and, and to be presented to them. Thank you. Any other questions? Yeah, one other, I guess, is we, we've sort of, we've delineated the island into town and country, and we, we're trying to put density around com commercial nodes and not put density out in the countryside. You know, we don't always follow that at town meeting, but that's sort of the goal. Uh, how strongly does the state view, you know, if we look and say this is, this is all car dependent trips, this is not near uh, services, et cetera, do they look at that, like new urban principles that they're pushing, or do they not look at that? Yeah, I would say that you go back to the standard and that the burden of proof is, is on the town to show that that's a local concern that outweighs the regional need for affordable housing, you know, with that heavy presumption there. I think that that's certainly a case that can be presented. But I would be concerned, you know, particularly if it has been honored at times in the breach. You know, certainly if there were a master plan that had been, you know, precisely followed and there were, there were specific aspects to it, 
that would be, you know, one argument that you could make. But I think that the message that the state has given and that the courts have 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 given uh, in in reviewing what the state has come up with in way of regulations and what the HAC does is that the need for affordable housing is seen as so critical that they want to make sure that that burden stays heavily on the town to show that there is a really an, you know an overwhelming reason to say no or to condition a project. And so that's why it's so important to have the factual, you know, the factual aspects of all of the elements fully flushed out and so that everybody brings to bear, you know, their education and their knowledge of all the different parts of the plan and, and the different parts of the town. Any comments, um, something that you want to see in the letter or edit? Um, there's one thing that's that that I wanted to talk about a little bit that's not in the letter, and that's um, I, and I think that this would be somewhat unique to Nantucket, so maybe it hasn't been seen before. But I do know that the that the Cape does some limiting on this in terms of um, limiting the market rate pieces of this project in terms of summer rentals. Oh yes, that the affordables absolutely. No, not the affordables. Okay, because the the affordables obviously would be. You know, as part of the regulatory agreement, they will be right. restricted. That those would be year round. And, and I have seen Nantucket restrictions, residents. particularly on rental projects. Uh, you know, here it's all ownership. I have seen and and would not have a problem recommending a condition that there, uh, if there is a rental of a unit that uh, of a market rate unit, that it would need to be on a yearly basis, you know, as opposed to a weekly basis. Certainly, I've given that advice throughout the Cape, Wellfleet, East Ham. And I, I believe that that has not been challenged. Okay. Is that something you'd like to explore to put into the letter? I think it's something that the ZBA should consider because um, the getting into a situation where there are many pieces of the property doing weekly turnovers creates a whole other layer of traffic and activity. Understood. That was something that came up this morning at the Affordable Housing Trust, and that was one of the concerns that um, the discussion about uh, sort of the mid-income housing, that there's some sort of restrictions on those, whether it's the weekly rentals, the monthly rentals, or an income restriction on it. And the ability to do that without it being an actual covenant in controlling those market rate houses. So that was a major concern. I just want to say that, you know, I... I think that this letter, the wording needs to, at least from my point of view, it needs to indicate um, uh, how for or against we are on this project. I found the wording to be a little bit soft. And I, I personally want the, uh, the ZBA to know that I am adamantly opposed to this as it is with the density. And I think that it's, I think it's appalling appallingly abusive to the land and to the community on the whole with this kind of density and to the neighborhood. So that's not the kind of wording to go into a letter, but that's the scale of my, um, of how much I dislike this project. And I think that 50% ground cover impervious service surface in a wellhead protection zone is, it should be illegal because it's really, that's protecting our, our water quality, our drinking water and our pond water. So I, I really think this to me, none of this would be negotiable without some kind of decrease in density. And I, I do think I've had a long discussion. There's been a lot of um, discussion about 40Bs and changing them, and we've heard that they're not changing, so we have to work within the bounds. And I think we've seen how 40Bs can be used uh, for good projects. And I think to me, and, and I made this comment earlier at the Affordable Housing Trust, to me this is a sledgehammer 40B, and I think it's totally inappropriate for this neighborhood. That's, that's what I'd like to see explained in the letter or translated into appropriate language. And how do we, is that just you give direction to? Yeah. To, uh, town, to, to town for me right. to tighten up the, the wording in a way that um, is more, it's not wishy-washy. It's not maybe if it would be nice or should. I still think it, it wherever possible, it should be musts on some of these um, uh, some of the, the comments were shoulds and mostly shoulds, and I just, I think it should be must, wherever possible. Is this one of those areas, I guess a question for 
for us or Ilana, where um, we really put our foot down on this. And is it, is it could it be too far and the state throws it out because it's because we use the wellhead to just say what, what, what Reed explained? Well, when the ZBA looks at this and makes a determination as to whether to deny, grant, grant with conditions, it will look at the peer review results uh, that it gets from, from the experts. And so in particular, on this issue, there would be a need and, and, an, and I'm sure um, a focus uh, for the ZBA to, to look at the wellhead protection issue and what the, what the expert peer review consultants come back and say, you know, what is the harm? Because again, while that's an important interest, and I actually have one pending right now where there was a denial based upon protection of water quality issues. Uh, we'll see where that goes. Um, but here, if there were a denial or if there were conditions saying, look, you're too close, you're, it's, it's too much impervious surface, the, you know, the amount of, the percentage of impervious surface is too high, it needs to be lowered, it would be, it would be better, obviously, and more defendable if that were based upon what the peer review consultant came back and said, here is what the harm is. And, and this is why you, you need to do this. And the recommendation is that you know, 15% is certainly what you would want. Maybe 20% would be something that you could do, but 50% perhaps is not. And you, know, but you would need the, the peer review consultant to you know, assist with that. But certainly the, uh, the message would be, presumably from this board, uh, to the ZBA that you hope that they will focus on that and, and will look very carefully at that issue and, and, and express what great concern you have for that issue. And one quick thing uh, for with the gym. Where in the process would it be, re if it was going to be reduced from 152 homes or the ground cover, does that happen if it only gets denied or is, could that happen from There's now a, until the end? It's a, a great question. And the way that that works is that there is an, almost a dance provided for under the rules. And the way that it works is that the developer comes in, makes the presentation, the board listens, has peer review, and then the board makes comments and says, look, this is what we want to see. And we've looked at your waivers and we have concerns about the setback waivers, you know, whatever they might be. And so we really don't want to give these setback waivers. We really want to see this kind of separation, additional separation between um, these, these buildings that you're proposing in larger lots and so forth and less impervious surface. And then the developer has the opportunity to come back and say, well, you've asked us for a menu of items and you've asked us for 10 things. We can do three of them. The other seven we can't and we won't. And those seven, we say, will render our project uneconomic. Once that happens, the music changes. And then the ZBA has the opportunity then to say, all right, you say that these conditions will render the project uneconomic we as a board have the, the right to ask you to give us a pro forma to show us how these conditions would render your project uneconomic. And what that involves is an analysis by the um, developer to come back with the original pro forma that was given to the subsidizing agency that formed the basis of the project eligibility letter, and then a new pro forma that shows how the profitability of the project would change based upon these additional conditions. And then the board, the ZBA, when it gets that information, it then has the opportunity to have that peer reviewed by an economic consultant who is familiar with how these things are valued. And that consultant would look at the information and come back with a report saying, yes, you know, this would render the project uneconomic, or no, it wouldn't. In the event that the answer is no, it wouldn't, then the ZBA has the opportunity to just impose all those conditions. Because if it doesn't render the project uneconomic, they can impose those conditions. If it does, then the ZBA goes back to that heavy burden to show that the conditions that it's trying to impose, let's say it's lowering of height, uh, you know, in increasing the setbacks, you know, whatever it might be, which in, in turn would reduce the density, they would say, well, we want to do this anyway because we think that there is a local concern here that outweighs the regional need for affordable housing. That's how that would work. Um, I just, uh, we've already written one letter to the state uh, as part of that uh, application process. I think a lot of what we've said will probably add to this letter, um, but it's still a letter. And while I don't want to um, in any way overstep the boundaries of the ZBA, 
Um, I think the select boards, you know, we're, we're, I think we're trying to struggle with what the role of the select board can be. And I'm wondering if there's something more we can do than just send a letter. Um, I've heard that, you know, I've heard board members raise the issue of impervious surfaces, of parking, of density. Um, and I know there's a agenda item on here to do a, a traffic study. Um, and we've talked about peer review, and I'm wondering if there's some other kind of uh, model where um, right now I couldn't, I, I wouldn't be expert enough to give advice to the CBA on, you know, what density might be better for impervious surfaces, whether it's 50% or something. But I think that's something that we should be able to, we might, we might want to consider to be able to do. So um, maybe we get our own review maybe we you know have some other folks to advise us on um, on how to give some guidance to the ZBA um, so I'm just struggling with how to do more than just if anything just then just sending a letter so I put that out as a comment and something for us to discuss and and yes I, I have seen select boards in the past if they have a particular issue of concern and they see the peer review report come back and they're dissatisfied with it to go out and get their own peer review or just do it anyway uh, before they even get the peer review. I'm back. talking about anyway. I mean, yeah. I, you know, just, yeah. I mean, it's a lot, it's a big issue. I, I mean, I don't know if that's, a, um, but I, I'd like to have some idea about things like ground cover and whatever thing. I don't know. So just, just throw that out as an idea. Mm -hmm. I think uh, following on from that, and there are, firms that do this, one of the things that really caught my eye about the waivers were clearly my focus on is on water quality, but the waiver for the determination of wetland boundaries, which I think would be a, an absolute mistake, but um, the, the uh, waivers for trees. And I think as stormwater management being sort of one of the last pieces of the puzzle that we've been looking at in regards to water quality, I think there's a tendency to um, sort of downplay the need to make sure that we are managing stormwater properly. And there is there's a tangible value to put on trees and their uh, impact their flood mitigation services. So when a site gets clear cut and then the trees don't get replaced, um, you you increase the opportunities for flooding. And I think those are the kind of things that I I would like to know if um, specific to the context of this project, if that was a, a peer review of some sort. Um, you know, where's that balance between needing to make sure that we're not increasing flooding um, and clear cutting a site? So and, I, and that, what you just said, may not be part of the peer review that the ZBA is doing. Right. I don't know. Right. So, but yeah. if, if we are passionate about some element of that as a board, then maybe we get our own mm -hmm. consultants to take a look at it. Yeah. Question on time frame: If we wanted to do more studies of our own. Do we have enough time? You have enough time at this point. Okay. You know, certainly it's 180 days from the date that the public hearing opens by the ZBA for the public hearing to be um, finished. However, the process often is extended beyond that, that time frame. But at this point, there still would be time remaining to go out and, and get, get those kind of reports and get them in. Yeah, Jason. Yeah, just one, one thing that kind of struck me, I'm just thinking about it. You talked earlier about they typically don't see five bedroom market homes inside of a development like this. Uh, if the goal of this project is to improve the you know, amount of affordable housing on Nantucket, uh, then you know, I would contend that this won't improve it because the houses that are being built, the 75% that will be market are going to, you know, are going to require landscaping and cleaning and everything else. And those, you know, the people that are going to need to do those jobs, you know, I think it's four or five per dwelling are going to get eaten up by the housing that we are being provided. So we're actually getting behind. And I think that's a sort of a unique Nantucket factor that I think should be approached somehow. Uh, and, I, and, and I also think it, but it also gives us opportunities. I mean, I think that it's a, but, but from the, from the, harm point i do think it isn't it really isn't going to help us if you look at some of the other you know so look at beach plum i have friends that are coming and they're renting for the summer and they're going to the uh, you know they're going to an airbnb in beach plum village on them one of the market units 
So that, you know, people are going to invest here. And this is where, you know, it's going to be a nice subdivision. It'll be dense as, if it's built like it is, it's going to be really dense. But the houses are going to be nice and Airbnb. It's going to look great on, you know, online. And so I, I think we're going to have more demand in there for certain dwellings than the state is used to. And well, so how do we address that so, sort of thing? So long as they meet their 25% affordability, you, your, your hands in that respect are, 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 are tied. And this is a complaint that I hear all the time, obviously, because if you have a 25% requirement, you go and, and, and you build 100 units and you do 25 of them, 25% is as affordable. Well, the 100 units that you're creating creates a need for 10 new affordables. So you're only gaining 15. So it's really you know, a very slow um, progress. And that, that is as it is. And, but I think we won't, I think we, because of the demand for the units that'll be built, I think we're going to be not even just 10. I think we might be equal or negative. You know, I think we're going behind. If you actually did the analysis of what, you know, in these, and I think it would be different than the rest of the state. The other thing I do think there's an opportunity because the economics and how much some of the market rate can be sold for, I think there is an opportunity to get more tiers of affordability. And I think that these, you know, I think rather than, uh, you know, so I look at it and say there could be more tiers of affordability, there could be less density, we could get rid of the, uh, you know, and, and, and this goes into the realm of we should be asked, should this board be asking, before I tell you what I think, should this board be asking for what we want to see? You know, is that appropriate? It's it's certainly appropriate, and I can assure you that the ZBA is is ahead of the game on that, and has certainly said that to the developer already. Uh, the, the big concern that I usually hear, and I'm hearing on this project as well, is the need for affordability at 120 percent to 100, anywhere between 120 percent and 150 percent of the area median income. That that's it's just a huge concern, and so I know that in particular the, the ZBA chair has been very pointed. Uh, with the applicant about this issue and looking for a restriction, the developer has stated over and over again, you, you know, I, I assume in very good faith, saying that there is a concern on the developer side for that and that they intend to meet that requirement. And then, of course, the, the chair, without any prompting from me, immediately said, well, but if it isn't restricted, you know, even if you sell it to someone within, you know, that ambit, within 120 to 150 percent of, of AMI, if it's not restricted, it can be turned around and a windfall achieved, and, it, and then it's it, and it's no longer serving that purpose. So I can assure you that the ZBA is very focused on that issue and doing what it can to speak with the applicant and to try to try to promote that concept. But again, you know, including that in your letter and communicating that, I think is very appropriate. You know, to ask that that be uh, considered and, and promoted. I think that's very important. Any other comments or questions right now for Alana or for us? Will we, will we, will we come yeah, back just, after we hear public yeah, comment? So. Okay. Yeah, I want to reiterate some of the okay. points that are most important. Okay, so, so I'd like to have some, um, there's anybody here to, to talk about this, about the letter, um, anything they'd like to see in it more or edit it? Can we come over to this microphone? That way if staff, if there's any questions, staff can, can be at that microphone, if that's okay. Anybody here like to talk about this agenda item? Okay. Anything well, I'm going to I'll say so. Okay. Uh, Edward Tool, the ZBA chairman. I just want to talk briefly about what Jim brought up about uh, whether the Board of Selectmen wants to do more work in terms of giving the ZBA. Um, not more ammunition, but more information in terms of some of these uh, technical items, because we're not experts either. We don't know anything about the well uh, recharge area. We need help with that kind of thing. We cannot commission, and we don't have the power to uh, ask, well, we can ask you. And that's what we were going to do about traffic study, uh, the traffic study. So I encourage you, if you have an issue and it's technical and you want to help us out, have at it. Good. Thank you. Well, that's, a, that's a progress, I think. 
Okay. Hey, what's your name? Hi, David Iverson. I live on South Shore Road. Um, I just want to thank the the board here for giving this the very serious review it needs, and as well with Ed and the ZBA. Um, I think most people truly appreciate that this is beyond anything we've ever seen built here. It's it's in a very de already densely populated place with 40 bees. I mean, within two miles, I think almost every 40 bee on this island exists. And how fair is that? Talk a lot about health. Is it good for the health of the community? How about the health and the welfare of the people that live in that area? I mean, I think that really needs to be looked at beyond the traffic. The wellhead is, of course, a huge concern. But all of us that live in this surfside area, all of a sudden, is just every 40B is being dumped there. And how fair is that to us as the residents, the quality of our life and, and, and the welfare, our, our well-being? So I think that that really is a, a very important thing that, that should be looked at. But even beyond that in the bigger picture, there needs to be something done about the 40 bees in general with the 25% rule on this island. I just, I feel strongly that it doesn't work. We don't have the space. And as, as everyone's noted, at the 25%, we're not gaining on our shy. We, we're not going to ever make it, yet we continue to destroy precious, fragile property around the island. And, and as the well, I mean, as the, as the, Sewer district grows, more properties become at risk for this. So um, I really urge you guys to really take a closer look. And, and I think that most everyone on this island would really appreciate a much stronger letter from this board um, opposing this. Um, thank you. Thank you. Hi, Sue Ellen Delcourt. I live at 91 Hummock Pond Road, nowhere near the development, but I live on this island. I want to thank you all for your support of the community um, and backing the community to try and send a letter to the state with really strong language of why this is detrimental to our community here. My feeling is, and probably the bigger picture, is Nantucket's an island. It's unique in that fact. We have limited resources on this island, being water, sewer, trash removal. We're already redesigning the dump to sustain the added traffic situation there. And what kind of overdevelopment of the island will cause further problems there? Um, problems as far as food supply, uh, electric supply, did I say that? Read in the paper that they're bringing generators to the island uh, in case of a cable failure. So we put on added demands of the electric company, the water. Um, so I think that the board needs to send a strong message to the government. And I agree with Jim Kelly that something other than just a letter should and could be done. And I'm hoping that you'll take the time and the energy to send that message. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, I'm Diane Cabral, 8 South Shore Road. Um, I just want to thank you all and thank the ZBA. We could go on forever with our concerns, but I didn't have much to say because I just feel like you're getting it. To hear Rita's comments, to hear all of you comment, it just feels like you get it, and um, we're really grateful for that. My big issue is safety. I say it all the time. We have one way out. So sure, it's a dead-end road. So when all these people come out, instead of going, they could go to the right to the sewer treatment plant, but I think that most of them will take a left to the one stop sign that we have. And I invite everybody to come by and see what an extra over 300 cars are going to do. It's just not safe. If there's a fire or an accident, we're in big trouble. And I just am grateful for all of you. I worry about our wells. I'm right across the street from that. And we have the pond. I'm not against 40 bees. My family has benefited from them. I 
welcomed Sabrum, Sachem's Path, Abram's Quarry. Love it. But this one is just over the top. And thank you for all your time and effort. Thank you. Hello, Sean Corral, South Shore Road. Um, again, I'd like to say thank you I'm very much. I mean, it is, you know, it's obvious that some of you are really, you know, opposed to this. I shouldn't say some of you, you know, it seems like you're very opposed to this, so really thank you very much. Um, you did say that, uh, that some people were asking if you could do more. And the only, um, you know, suggestion that we could say, or the only thing, request that we could actually make as a community or as a group, is we've been actually talking about um, making a request to you to actually contact your, uh, the state representative and have them contact other state re representatives around the state to see if they've had any uh, feedback about negative, uh, you know, about the 40B process in other towns. So just like all of ours, all of us neighbors in the community got together and are fighting this 40B, you know, together, I think that there may be other neighborhoods or other communities in Massachusetts. So maybe if you reached out to the state rep, you know, just to see if there are any other cases around the state, that maybe we could all just try to go together to make a difference. So at least try to get some exemptions put in, you know, maybe we could have some other houses counted in our housing stock or get some exemptions at least for, you know, for Nantucket. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Sean. Is there anything, any other comments on this letter? Anything you Just want to, one more comment. Uh, one on question. the letter? Yes. Okay. Well, actually on town council, and I don't need to monopolize, but um, you mentioned, town council mentioned, um, the Weston and Sampson report from 2016. Could you tell me what that what that is? Thank you. Yeah, that's through the through the board. Yes, the, there was a 2017 Weston and Sampson report with regard to sewer capacity issues, and so sewer connections obviously are very important for this particular project. There's absolutely no room for uh, Title V compliance, that's for sure. And so they are looking to connect to the sewer. And so when I saw the uh, the comments, the draft comments, they related to this report, so I asked for a copy of it, and I do have it, and I will make sure that it's integrated into the into the board's comments. Anybody else? Have a comment? Please, please state your name. Uh, Chuck Delcourt, 91 Hunt Pond. Um, a point, uh, first of all, thank you to... Uh, Suckman and the BDA for all the attention this is getting. A point that Mr. Fee brought up, when I, and I don't know if it's something that can be developed on or not, but how many times, you know, the state says, here's the model, here's the annual income, here's the cost of living, et cetera, et cetera. Well, how many times have we heard the news when they say price of gas is X amount national average and the highest price for gas is in Hawaii and it's 350 and we're 450 at our pump? Um, I feel like our community is not really in the statistics, and maybe that's something we can exploit where we're a little more unique than other parts of the state and even other parts of the country. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, I'm Georgia Raisman, uh, Low Beach Road in Sconset, far away from this issue, from physically. Um, in terms of, I don't know if these comments are supposed to be limited to this letter, and unfortunately, um, so I may be, it may be relevant, but I think it would be helpful to hear officially from the fire department, rather than unofficially, as I think the Zoning Board of Appeals has heard, about the public safety issue. I think the, whether, the, whether access is uh, really going to be a, a major issue would be important to me if I were living there. As somebody pointed out, this is a community that cannot rely on nearby communities for additional fire access. We don't have, we can't call on people 20 miles away or five miles away to bring additional firemen in and to be able to get them in there, get them in there in the numbers that are required in the case of any kind of serious emergency, I think would be a really important issue. I think um, the wellhead is a, the wellhead and the aquifer, the sole source aquifer is an irrevocably important issue and ought to be addressed on maybe on the basis of some, of some sort of scientific study, if possible. And then finally, I think generally, it would be really helpful to have the town consider seriously lobbying on a state level for some kind of amendment to 40B as it applies to Nantucket. I don't think we should try to say we should be exempt 
but I think it would be helpful if we, there could be some sort of amendment where we our the either the time available to us to qualify for 25% or whether it should be 25% or less, or whether the it, whether we should be addressing the issue in a different way, whether we should be given credit for addressing it in a different way. I think all of those things should be taken up on the state level because of our unique situation, both for public uh, safety issues and for the uh, aquifer issues, for the issues of uh, waste disposal and the other things that have been addressed tonight. I think all of those require some kind of lobbying on our part, and I don't see any reason why it shouldn't be successful. We and Martha's Vineyard occupy a unique geographical position, and that should be enough to start the discussion on the state level. Thank you. Thank you, Georgia. Hello, uh, <clears throat> Patrick Tafe, uh, 21 Okawa. I'd like to thank the board for listening to us. And I'd just like to say, Matt, I, I think you hit on something. Um, I don't think the numbers work. Um, if we keep building at this accelerated rate and each 40B that comes along, 75% uh, of the homes are, are market rate and 25% affordable, can, can the board run the numbers and see, do we have to build 5,000 more houses on Nantucket to hit the shy? Um, it, it might just not work here at all. And what Nantucket does need is affordable housing. We don't need the 75% market rate along with it. So we are a unique place. Uh, you don't have the opportunity to drive to the next town. Um, Nant Nantucket is very unique. And um, Nantucket isn't affordable. And it's like we're trying to put lipstick on a pig. There has to be another way to do this. And I'm just wondering if it's time that the town seriously jumps into it um, and we take it on ourselves and build affordable housing that assimilates into the island um, and not build Walmarts in everybody's neighborhood. Thank you. Thanks, I just have to make a comment. We have worked incredibly hard for the entire three years that I've been on this board to do exactly that. We have a project approved next door here that creates six, all 64 units count towards our shy. And we would not be having this discussion right now because we would be in safe harbor if three neighbors did not appeal that. And just, we have put such a tremendous amount of effort to try and address this. And I just, I, I, I need to make that somewhat clear to everybody that, you know, no, pro nothing is gonna be perfect in terms of a housing project. Those are apartment buildings. Um, we spent a lot of time trying to design something and approve something that would work and would address this issue. And, um, and yeah, and, and, and that is, um, it's all rental, so it all counts towards the shy, and there are varying degrees of affordability. I think it's 60% of it is affordable, or 80% of it is affordable. <laughs> So it bears uh, repeating, we wouldn't have this item on the agenda tonight if three of your neighbors hadn't uh, filed a suit, a claim against this project. Um, and we would be at our shy list. We would have this, we would have a, um, we, you know, we would um, have our safe harbor um, and we'd be able to go to home at a decent time tonight. So... Uh, um, so just, uh, and, and I, maybe I'm a little sensitive because, you know, we, you know, Matt, Matt and Don as uh, participants in this work group, uh, spent countless, David Worth and others spent countless hours developing this project. It's, um, I think it's, an, uh, it's a national model, uh, and it's very frustrating and, uh, for us to be sitting here tonight when victory was, so close at hand. Rita? I just wanted to also comment on what you said, Don, and some of the things that have come up tonight, because they've come up to me from all over the island. It's not just this neighborhood that this is a community issue. It's not just because it's in my backyard or my neighborhood. Um, I'm all for affordable housing. I don't like 40Bs. And I agree with almost all of those. I've had long conversations with Tucker. I, I would love to change the 40B. It's much more difficult than we'd like to think, and every town thinks they're unique. There's also 40Bs done well that can have positive impact. 
So I, what I really would encourage everyone who has cared about this project or any other project like this, the town, this board is making a lot of efforts. We are prioritizing affordable housing, but for everyone who stands up when it is in their neighborhood and says they care about affordable housing, please send us ideas. This has been the most overwhelming and discouraging topic that has come up, and it feels pretty lonely. There's not a lot of people really um, from the general public that are committed uh, not just in a, I support affordable housing, but taking action. So we need ideas and it is a community issue and we need to be a little more innovative and a little less um, site specific in our thinking. We really need to try and crack this on a smaller scale so that we have 40 Bs in affordable housing that is appropriate for the context of Nantucket, so. Thank you, well said. Um, Megan Perry, I live off of Hooper Farm. Um, and I just want to thank you guys very much for all the work you are doing on that. I think the reason you see all of us here is as the law states, the burden of proof is on us to say we don't want this. This is not going to work for Nantucket. And our quality of life far outweighs the need for this small amount of affordable housing that would be going in. And I think I'm sorry that you guys are seeing us all frustrated, but I think we're all frustrated with it. And we're all trying to understand it and we're all trying to support you guys. We, we understand it's been tough on you as well. And thank you guys for, for putting in those letters and continuing to ask the state to consider Nantucket to be a little bit different than the rest of the state. Thank you. Thank you. This is what we signed up for. <laughs> Though you're frustrated, this is who you come to. <laughs> Any other uh, comments on the agenda item? Maybe we'll take one more and then we'll um, talk if there's any other comments of the board, any more from the Virginia item. Jacques Zemicki, uh, Wera Wera Lane. Uh, thanks for hearing all our comments tonight. Really appreciate it. Um, my comment, actually I have two comments. One is that this really is an island-wide uh, problem in the sense that it impacts our aquifer. Our sole source aquifer in Nantucket is unique from many other sole source aquifers. Uh, USGS did a study 30 years ago and came to the conclusion that, that it was very unique. The way water infiltrates, the way water doesn't evaporate, etc. Um, and one of the takeaways from that original report done in the 70s was that any kind of uh, pollution that happens um, on the surface of Nantucket actually will get into our water table way quicker than it will in many other places. Um, the one thing that has saved Nantucket from actually having polluted uh, sole source act for at this point, and there are places in Nantucket where there's nitrogen loading that you can get nitrogen out of wells and stuff like that, but in general, the, the thing that has kept us from destroying our aquifer is the layer of hardening we have. Uh, which ends up binding up a lot of the chemicals we spill, the gasolines, and filters that out before it gets into our sole source aquifer. Um, the way um, stormwater is managed is crucial to the health of our aquifer here. Um, there are ways of filtering out oils in non-emulsified uh, things that float on the surface out of the water. That You might hear someone talk about storm scepter systems or similar type systems that are actually in use in Nantucket. Uh, these systems need to be maintained very regularly. Uh, a lot of states regulate the way they're maintained. Nantucket has no regulations how they're ma maintained. We don't even have anybody on the island that can maintain them because it, it requires uh, being able to pump the oil out with a small hose, and no one has a truck with a small hose. Uh, and the sediment that gets into these things uh, has to be sent, if you could pump it out, it would have to be sent off island because our landfill wouldn't take it. Um, so one of the questions that I would like to answer, and I think it's great that uh, you guys are thinking about maybe hiring some outside experts, but it'd be really great to have somebody uh, come in and look at our sole source aquifer and how 
these systems work or don't work um, in regards to sole source aquifers. I mean, the storm scepter system, and I don't really want to get too technical, but the storm scepter system really takes out oil, which is, you don't want oil and gas in your, in your groundwater. But uh, nowadays, turpentines, or what we call turpentines, are water-soluble, so they just go right through the system. There are the government, the EPA found that not, there are 97 out of uh, 127 chemicals of concern that are found in stormwater. Uh, and most of those chemicals are just going to bypass the systems that uh, are currently in place. And it's a huge load with that impervious surface of 48% or 54% or whatever it is. That's a really huge load to be putting into an aquifer. And what happens is the aquifer is sort of a bubble, but you actually, the way you load it with, in a concentrated area is that you actually, it's like taking a hypodermic and injecting pollutants or whatever comes through that system into the aquifer at that point. Um, John, if I can stop you there. Yep. I think what you're saying is we need stormwater management study. Yes, on we do. This. Yep. But, and then actually just one other thing on your, specifically on your letter, uh, the snow. Snow should not be piled on where the drainage tiles for the, um, for the wastewater. Because what happens is you've already punched a hole through the hardening and you put something, there's a pollutant source on top of, the, on top of that and it just actually will go into the groundwater much quicker as opposed to being hauled off site or plowed to the side of the road with sufficient area to uh, you know, dispose of it there. Thank you. Thank you. Any comments or thoughts? Summarizing? Um, I have a question. I don't know if anybody has done this calculation yet. If there was a parking space provided for each bedroom in this project, how much would it decrease the density? <laughs> Can we try and find out? I certainly don't think that that calculation has been done, but I do want to emphasize that the ZBA has asked for peer review of the parking to you know, compare it to what the requirements are and to look at the, the overall demand, of course, as well. So a very important question. Um, so just to, uh, so peer review of parking, I mean... Um, we spend a lot of time talking about parking on Nantucket. Uh, planning department, planning board talks a lot about parking and new, and new developments and things. They so we, I think there's some local expertise about that here, and I, and there's an understanding of the um, uniqueness of Nantucket. So how does that get into the whole peer review process? Yeah, certainly um, you're used to within the zoning context that the reason why these decisions are made locally is because the local officials are familiar with local conditions, uh, and that's why this happens in the way that it does. But within the 40B context, where the burden of proof is so heavy and is on, on the town, there's really a need to document, document, document what it is that you're talking about no. to support. And so the board has heard evidence already with respect to the fact, the anecdotal evidence, that the nearby 40Bs um, have, a, have a parking issue. It, they came in and they, they had a certain level of parking, which probably will be commensurate with what's being asked for here. And now they have a parking problem. And so that is something that they can document. And that will be part of you know, their, their knowledge that they can bring to bear on this. So the peer review can be guided by local experts and data. Yes, absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. I think on, on the note of transportation as well, it's important that... Um, and, I'm not sure if it's appropriate in our letter, just as a comment to some of the waivers that they have requested, is that we keep a focus on non-vehicular uh, transportation within any development because there's been a request to waive bike paths, lighting, and what is it? Uh, street lights, bike paths. Um, and if we're going to be short on parking or if there's it, all those kind of transportation issues, I think it's important that those kind of things shouldn't be waived so that it's in keeping with our priority of non-vehicular transportation. So is that a is that a request that that be be added 
Yeah, be added that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Because yeah. <coughs> I think that, I think that makes sense. If you're gonna waive parking, you've got to give the alternatives. So you mm -hmm. can't waive the alternatives. Right. I think it makes a lot of sense. Erica? Um, I just realized one thing that we didn't add into the letter that we did discuss at the um, pre-construction meeting for this, and that was any potential um, improvements to South Shore Road. Um, one thing that we in the town have noticed is that when special projects are approved, either by planning or zoning, um, there tends to be some damage to the town's roadways during construction. Um, case in point, we just had to repave the area all around Cumberland Farms on Orange Street um, beyond what um, what we what we thought was needed at the beginning. And that was never, I don't think, included in any planning board decision. And it's something that I know that the DPW director has been talking to planning a little bit about um, in terms of incorporating those types of things into future developments, but it might be something that we want to consider here as well because um, during the course of this very long phased project, if it goes forward, um, it's going to be a lot of construction vehicles, heavy equipment, and the possibility of damage to our roadway is probably pretty high. Let me do have everything kind of summarize the direction of, of uh, what we're asking or, or want to explore? Well, I jotted down a bunch of notes, including add limitation on rental of market rate units, tighten up wording to indicate more musts, less shoulds, address impervious surfaces, no waivers for any transportation related issue, this issue that Erica just mentioned, and I'm just kind of going through it a bit, and there's a few typos and things that need to be corrected, but we're obviously not done with this yet. So those were the main things that that I got. Are there are there more? So we'll just add to the letter, but there's also right, the conversation stuff. about what additional resources or help we can give yeah. the ZBA, whether it's on uh, stormwater, parking, um, impervious surfaces, wellhead protection. Wellhead protection. I think they requested help on traffic. Was yeah. they did? Yeah, that's, yeah. Our that's our just next right. item. Yeah. but there's a list of others that. Right. And I think they asked for help, so how can, how can we help them? Okay. Do you need more clarification on that? Or is that, is that well, I, um, the areas I jotted down were stormwater, parking, impervious surfaces. We're talking about traffic in a minute. I, I don't really know what other things they want help with that they aren't already doing peer reviews on. I think we're talking about the board taking a role in getting peer review or giving them the resources to do it um, and not just not uh, this is more than just putting something in a letter it's at least my what I'm trying to put forward okay. if there's anything else that we don't have then we can talk about it our next meeting or in between I, th I think it'd be helpful maybe for town council to do some research on um, what other board uh, select boards have done um, when they have areas of special concern i think we talked uh mentioned that not now but as, as informing the town manager when she comes back to us with suggestions and not to take up too much of the board's time but i certainly have seen in in the very recent past where a select board hired you know a specific uh consultant to come in and talk about water quality issues that was important and, and okay. that sounds like a good idea yeah, but, you know, your wellhead protection yeah. issue is a critical one here. Yeah. And so that might be something that the board wants to focus on. So, okay. should we do that? Yes. I, yes. I, yes. 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 Absolutely. Is that right. a yeah. consultant or someone who's coming just to speak? No, right. consultant. I mean. in, in the case that I'm speaking of, there was a, a, a proactive reaching out to, by the select board to hire someone independent and, and to make a report. Okay. Uh, so period. should we do that? Absolutely. So we should we should, uh, we should direct town administration to do that if that's something we want to do. No. Probably look into an option and a price and where we might be able to have, get the funding from. That, that was going to be. I, I could see living on. <laughs> where's, like, where's, the where's the money coming from? <laughs> yeah, she had the where's the money face on. <laughs> so I, I, you know, I, I'll just put this, you know, as I don't know, as a motion that the board engage a, the town engage a consultant to give us 
to do peer review on, you know, water quality, um, impervious surfaces, wellheads, wellhead protection, um, and ask the town manager to come back with a proposal, costs, you know, to do so and maybe get some uh, help from town council on identifying sources. Okay. That's my motion. Second for discussion. Second. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Yeah, the other comment, I just, I think, we, we all know Nantucket's special, but I've lobbied up in Boston a bit, and they don't really care. And, and so, you know, and, and if we're thinking we're going to change the 40B laws in time to impact this, that's not going to happen. Uh, you know, we can, we can do that as a gesture. We can do that at town meeting in the future, but we, you know, we have to uh, live in, in uh, reality. And the reality is that this issue is in front of us now, and we've got to find a way to deal with it the best way we can. Uh, if I'm wrong, Ilana, correct me. Uh, so, uh, you know, so, and so that's sort of in general, uh, you know, I, and when I see something like this, I would like to be able to say, instead of just saying no to everything, you know, I would like to be able to say what do, what is acceptable? What do we want? Mm -hmm. You know, what would be okay? What would be okay for the community here? And I've probably written to a number of you and, you know, a number of you have probably been kind of upset with me. But what I would see as acceptable, I would say, as this is my own personal opinion, has nothing to do with the board, I would say no apartment buildings, make the density similar to Beach Plum or Sachem's. Uh, that would hopefully make the, getting rid of the apartments would hopefully make the project more affordable. Therefore, the project could potentially give more tiers of affordability. And if we had something like that, I think we would turn, you know, a lemon into lemonade. You know, I think that what, what is being presented all of a sudden would, could be something that we may not love it, but, you know, we take care, of, it would still, you know, it would still take care of the ecological problems. It would cut the density quite a bit and it would give something we're proud of. It would also give an example to future uh, people that want to come here and do 40 Bs, it would give them an example because our economics are such that there's a lot of money to be made. And these guys are limited to how much money they can keep. They can only keep 20%. So if they make more of that, they can give that back to the town in more affordable, permanently affordable units. And so I think that there is a win-win here if the, you know, if the community is, you know, is willing to work with the developers and more importantly, if the developers are willing to listen to the ZBA and work with the community. And I would hope that something like that, that something good comes out of this. But that might be, you know, maybe I'm wishful thinking. And Matt, I, there was a conversation we had today at the meeting and just quickly to say that I agree absolutely. And I think, I don't know, everyone says there's no way to, to change the 40B, but I am not willing to give up hope that we can come up with a stunning alternative that allows us to do it in a way that suits Nantucket. So I think it's worth the effort, worth the thought, and definitely worth the input and feedback from everyone. Yeah, well, we can't do it. But if it works, you know, if it works for the developer, if it works for them, they can do it. Mm -hmm. You know, and they can give us something that would be better for Nantucket. So, I mean, that's, you know, that's my, you know, dream is that, you know, that that would happen. Well, yeah, if we could get to Safe Harbor, we can still have 40 Bay, mm -hmm. but have a different level of say in 40 Bay. Yeah. Can I, I was just, um, I had pulled up the whole history of 40 Bay. It's been on the books since 1969. And there was a vote actually brought up in 2010, which went to a, a Massachusetts state ballot vote and it lost, it lost 50, it was 58% to 42%. It's just an just interesting to fact. Keep the to keep the 40 B and it actually statewide. And that's why it's, it's, you know, going to fall on somewhat deaf ears at the state level. It accounts for 80% of the affordable housing statewide. It's really been the most effective way to get any affordable housing in all of Massachusetts. This is not me being in favor of this in any way. I'm just, it's just some reality about 40 B and what happens that, and, um, I think we, we could potentially try to get a higher amount of affordability on Nantucket by home rule petition. I would support that. I don't think it's going to, it's not going to make any difference to something that's before us right now. 
that. While you have that up, does it happen to say on there how much of the state, what percentage of the state has actually reached safe harbor? Um, oh, yeah, it, uh, it, it's not a lot. <laughs> does it say what it is? Uh, um, I'd love to know. I'll find it. Only because, I mean, if it's been a law since 1969 and let's say less than 20% of the state has actually made safe harbor, that's a long time to show that a law is not something mm -hmm. that's a good law to have, something we should revisit. And I don't think we should throw in the towel and say we're not going to change it. Why can't we? Well, it, it, it went up for a vote in I, 2010. I, I, it could t it, someone could try again. We could change it. And we could make it so it actually provides affordable housing in a good way for people. But if it's a small number of affordable housing, it's not really affordable. Think about what we're giving up. Yeah, I, I don't want to disagree, but I think it, it, this is in front of us now, and it's going to be yeah. something's going to happen in the next couple years. You know, it might drag out a bit. I'm, you know, I don't know exactly the timeline. I don't, you know, if we if we were really serious about changing it, there would have to be a statewide vote and a home rule. The home rule is not going to get supported. You know, maybe we can try it, but you know, we've been up there. I, I've seen it. We would have to do a statewide. We'd have to have a lot of money. And there'd have to be a lot of, you know, we'd have to mobilize a lot of people full time mm -hmm. to do that. Not that it isn't, you know, it isn't worth it, et cetera. But even if we did it, it would be a pyrrhic victory because this would already be there. So, you know, so we really, at this point, I think a effort should be to make this as acceptable as possible. What do we do when the next 40B comes in? <clears throat> because there's going to be another one. After so we this. win our appeal and we'll have safe harbor. Safe harbor. We need to do it ourselves to get to what's acceptable. Mm. And, and I don't know if this is correct, but isn't there a new census coming out in 2020? Would that affect our percentage and it, what might put us in safe harbor? It yes. could go down because it's based on year-round units, not seasonal. And we're really lucky it's year-round units. You know, we're, and we're not lucky that our, you know, our friends and neighbors are moving off and so there are less of them. But we're lucky that it's going the other way for the, in this issue alone. Uh, when you look at places like Aspen and Telluride, they don't look. They look and they say they want to have 30% of their housing affordable. They don't say 30% of their year-round. They say 30% of their entire housing stock. You know, and we are miles away from that. So this is a very good discussion. Let's get away from the agenda. Yeah. Yeah. And. One more comment, and we got to wrap this up and move on to the yeah. Thanks. agenda. Thank you very much uh, for having this conversation. I just want to say a couple of things. I had a few notes, and I do better without them. This issue has uh, come up, you know, this, this particular one, in the uh, height of social media. And um, since the six Tacoma, you know, the six... Uh, Fairgrounds project that no one heard of uh, was, uh, you know, blown up, let's just say. And that was a planning board decision. Richmond, I just want to bring up a couple of things about Richmond. Somebody here said, we need to do it ourselves. I think it was Pat said that. That's, that's what we did with Richmond, okay? April of 2015, they came in with a very modest plan for developing that property. And it was blown up at town meeting. There isn't probably a person in the last year that's even remembers that. In March, uh, November 9th, 2015, we passed an article that basically created the ability for us as a town to make, create its own housing like a 40b i'm not saying richmond's a 40b but it's like our way of doing it without having the state since then yes there's been some issues with richmond but every one of them can be addressed by us and they have and this right here this conversation you feel helpless don't you because the state is in charge not us so be careful when we say no at town meeting, when we talk about zoning changes, especially in South Shore Road, we wouldn't even be here right now. Five times we tried to change the zoning for this 14-acre parcel, might as well have been owned by Henry Coffin, 
just driving by every day. Oh, this land in the sewer district, 14 acres of free dirt, by the way, because the, the people that owned it really didn't buy it the way we think today. And Matt mentioned earlier, affordable on Nantucket. These, the affordable units are free. An affordable house on Nantucket, 800 grand. If there was 56, 156 houses on Nantucket for $800,000, brand new, they'd be sold in a week. This is a weird place. The formula doesn't work. I totally agree. That's why zoning has been our answer for years. Okay? So everybody stop complaining about the zoning that planning and other citizens have tried to do. There's reasons behind it. We need to get educated and stop hollering at each other and being angry and, and making accusations about public officials on Facebook and other things because it's wrong. Okay? Thank you very much for everybody's time. Don, do you want to go on that? Oh, I just wanted to give that data that there's 351 communities in Massachusetts and 39 have met their 10%. Okay. I'm sorry, could you say this? 39, there's 351 communities and 39 have met their 10%. And 101 have developed um, housing production plans. That's a, a small percentage. Do I have something wrong? That's, that's a little bit out of date. Just okay. I mean, I'm on Wikipedia. I did, I did add up. I, Megan, I think I gave this to you. Um, there's 66 that have reached 10. percent There's. Oh, that's really out of date then. So that's that's the change from whenever that Wikipedia article is, which I think is 2011. I'm looking. So like 18 18 percent, a little less than 20 percent, right? So there's 66 right, that have reached the 10% or exceeded it. There's 17 at 9%, 20 at 8%. That's, that's Thank you. according to, that's as of September 14th, 2017. Okay. So that's 18.5% okay, like have met it out of the whole state. Is that, is that right? Yep. Okay. Thank you. Thank you all for your comments. Yeah, the, 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 I need to. I need. I just can't help myself. I need to say one one quick thing. I know we have a lot to do, but there is that's that we aren't going to solve this just increasing supply. There has to be guardrails on price. You know, I feel that very strongly. Uh, you know, and, and to think that we're going to solve this by just continually carving the island up into more pieces that won't do it. I was also on a board that was afraid to put this through as a forty B. And Richmond is a 40B because 40B was a bad word, and people might not like the name 40B. Uh, if we had called, if we had used them as 40Bs, as soon and as soon as they were approved and before they were built, but they were accepted and not, you know, not uh, challenged by the neighbors, they would have counted. So both of those could have counted, but we did them in a different manner that didn't get them on the rolls quick enough. So, so there are there are options that we can do. So. Anyway, thank you, Mayor. So thank everybody for coming tonight and all their hard work. You know, one of the things that we kind of complain about as elected officials is the public doesn't get involved enough. Well, the public's involved in this one, and it's good. So I appreciate that. Thanks for coming out, all your emails. Thank you. Okay, we're going to move on to review of requests for a zoning board appeals for independent traffic study in connection with Surfside Crossing or the application. I think after that hour and a half right there. I think we're all pretty um, for that. The board wants to. Oh, yes, motion, motion to. To go forward with that. Anything you want to add, Libby? We're just going to have to figure out a scope um, and who's going to manage this. So Andrew and I talked a little bit about it at the beginning of the meeting, and we were going to try to get some traffic counters out over the weekend and into next week that could at least begin getting data together. Why, okay, my, now Mike is shaking his head. We're not doing that? Anyway, it, it doesn't matter. We're, we're going to need to get it. the yep. review done somehow. It's going to have to happen quickly. So there's, you know, we're going to have to rearrange resources to get this done. Okay. So, you have a motion? Yes, motion. Second. To move forward. Aye. 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 The motion approves. Is approved. 
moving on to annual review of code of conduct statement of um, commitment sign offs for committee board commission members this is uh, something that we ask all committee members to to read and understand and to sign it's a code of conduct or if you are elected or appointed is that is it up behind me? yeah and hopefully you all know that all elections mean that somebody has signed their statement okay We just like to bring bring this up to I think ninety percent have signed. And if they haven't, is it is it? Um, I mean, sometimes just oversight. Um, some elected officials have chosen very specifically not to sign. They feel that it um, that you can't dictate what they should or should not do because they are elected. Um, also, you'll see some spaces where it's staff. Staff is not required to do that because they're not really participating. They're more liaisons. Um, but I would say that our um, response has been really, really good about, you know, people take it seriously. They want to conduct themselves in a manner that's befitting their positions here, and they try really hard. I think it's more than just a piece of paper. I think it's, a, it's an agreement. It's acknowledgement that we all get along. Uh, disagree but be professional so I, I mean I don't know if there's uh, not something we can make a motion on maybe I'm saying if you're in an appointed position and, and you don't sign it or you don't agree then why does go through if we don't have this can we even do that does it even make sense yes I, I will note too that um, a lot some people who um, our new applicants don't realize that they have to sign the statement of commitment. It goes out after they get appointed. It goes with their appointment letter. Um, the majority of them send them in. I would say the high majority, you know, the vast majority of them do. So um, it would be difficult to hold back appointments based on that unless you were reappointing and somebody still hadn't done it. I think it's a good conversation to have because there's, in the world of kind of going back to what Nat mentioned earlier, in the world of social media, we all tend it's very easy to be a keyboard cowboy and to get angry at someone and um, be unprofessional when you're appointed or an elected official now there's no enforcement there's no rules we can't come in and, and take away your position because you said something on facebook or instagram that was um just um inappropriate but i, I would like to make sure our, our culture st stays positive because I think when we can continue to have conversations and avoid name calling um, or calling out staff on social media, to me that's just 100% inappropriate. And it's happened a little bit this year. And so that's why we wanted to put this um, on the agenda to make sure people are signing it, but also to make sure we're all in agreement that's important to us as a board. Any comments or thoughts? I, I agree. I agree 100 percent. I take it into consideration in my appointments. I look and see, you know, who's doing it and who isn't. It's it's not the only factor, but it's it's one factor that's in there. And I think it's some of this is sort of the golden rule. Treat people the way you'd want to be treated. Don't write something that, you know, and do something and do something that you wouldn't want someone writing about you. If you have an issue with someone, you know, take it up with them directly. I, I just think some of this is common sense, but it's lost in the kind of in the age we're in now sometimes, so. Um, in the social media age, it's become an increasing issue where I think people say whatever they're thinking that they wouldn't necessarily say to someone if they were directly in front of them. Mm -hmm. And um, I think we have to think a little bit more about that in general, but particularly as people who represent the town. And are meant to be working together positively, disagreeing as needed, but positively. And I think it really is impacting, having an impact on some of the committees. Um, to the comment about elected officials, um, you know, I don't look upon this as something that's been direct, that I've been directed to do. It's something that I embrace doing. And I would, it's my expectation that I would want to serve with other elected officials that felt the same way. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, board members.
Okay, we're on to 2018 Annual Committee Board Commission Appointments. All right. So, looking over this this morning, we have 17 committee commissions that um, have, for example, have two openings and two applicants, or have no applicants. And then we have five, Airport, Board of Health, Finance, Planning Board, Alternatives, and the Government Study that we have to take a vote on. So would the board like to do a blanket vote on the 17, and I can list those out, um, that are unopposed? I'll make a motion that um, where we have applicants that meet the uh, vacancies, that those folks be appointed with thanks. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 And just really quick, that's the Agricultural uh, Capital Committee, Cemetery Conservation Commission, Contract Review Committee, Council for Human Services, Council on Aging, um, I can't read my writing. Culture Council. Yep. HEC Associate, Mosquito Control, Affordable Housing Trust, uh, Real Estate Associate Committee, uh, Roads Right Away, Scholarship, Tree Advisory, ZBA and ZBA. Do you, do you want to make a note about yeah. Tree Advisory? Yes. Yeah, so, no applicants. so no applicants for Tree Advisory. Um, that has been it's kind of get a defunct uh, advisory committee. I haven't met in years. Um, there's no minutes. And they have to have a quorum to meet, and there's not enough people who are on it to have a quorum. So I don't know what the what's the best steps. If, you, if we just want to get rid of it, is that the best thing? To, yeah, I mean, there hasn't been minutes or a meeting in for years. Do we have to put that as a separate agenda item? To well, well I mean, it's not on the agenda tonight, yeah. so yeah, right. probably. Yeah, we should. So let's put it on agenda. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, Jim. Okay, so now we'll just we're going to do airport board of health, finance, planning, board alternative, and government study. So Eric is going to help me by messing any of this up. So airport, we had two seats available for applicants. The applicants are Peter Schaefer, Daniel Drake, Andrea Planzer, and Christopher Wininski. And we have so two seats for applicants. So we'll write two names down. And hand them over to me. Jason voted for Dan Drake and Andrew Planzer. Jim, uh, Drake and Planzer. Rita, Drake and Planzer. Don, Drake and Planzer. And I think that's you, Matt, Drake and Planzer. Just two in. And I had a really hard time because the other two candidates there were really good. Yeah, and, no, they were. And, which is not always the case. And, you know, <laughs> I wrote one and crossed it out, but... I agree and encourage both of them to apply again. The Board of Health, we have one seat and two applicants. Our applicants are James Cooper and Howard Dickler. Okay, uh, I voted for Mr. Dickler. We have Matt for Dickler. We have Don for, is it, I'm sorry, Cooper? Mm -hmm. Yeah, Cooper. Rita for Cooper and Jim for Cooper. So Mr. Cooper is on the Board of Health. And that was another hard one. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was a different one. Yeah. Okay, on to finance committee. Speaking of hard ones. My list. We have three seats available, five applicants. The applicants are Chris Golacki, Peter McEachern, David Worth, Peter Schaefer, and Nancy Wheatley. So we have to pick three of those.
Okay, Don. We have Worth, Blackie, and Kekron. Uh, Jason, Worth, Wheatley, and Kekron. Rita, Blackie, Kekron, Worth. Jim, Kekron, Worth, Schaefer. And Matt, Worth, Schaefer, and Kekron. I did not There's a tie, that. right? Two, one, two, and one. So you. Sorry, um, Mr. McEachern and Mr. Worth were both voted in unanimously, and then you have a tie between Mr. Glowacki and Mr. Schaefer with two of each for each. A tie with Glowacki and Schaefer. So you're going to have to vote again between those two. Okay. You treasure names on in case there's any questions that Eric has. I'm writing your bottom for you, man. You can't tell from my <laughs> my my terrible writing. Okay, Jason is Schaefer, Rita Glowacki. Hold on, hold on. Oh. Sorry. Sorry. Schaefer, Rita is Glowacki. Yep. Jim Schaefer, Don Glowacki, Matt Schaefer. So it's Mr. Schaefer. Okay, planning board alternative. See. Okay, we have two seats of four applicants. One is a three-year term, one is a one-year term. Um, how does the board want to do this? Do you just want to do a three-year term and one separate or our separate, separate vote? What's the easiest way to do this? I think we should do the three-year first, first and okay. do the one-year. So three-year first. I would just do, um, I thought it was based on the number. First, first gets three years, the second gets. Three you years. guys can do it any way you want. I'm big Emmy. It's I'm up to right. us. I'm just rather vote for two, see how it all shakes out. Rather than how, individual. How do we decide then after we all vote? Just the whoever top gets vote votes, four votes? Yeah, top vote gets three. Or, and, uh, and if it doesn't sort itself out, then we talk about it and yeah. do it. Yeah. If it's okay. unanimous. There you go. Yeah. Top vote. Does that make sense to you, so you're just voting for two? Yes, yes. And top vote will get the three year seat. I'm sorry, the four applicants, uh, Ladar Zola and Williams, Campbell Sutton, and Sean Cabral. For those listening on radio at home. It doesn't matter. Why am I following it? I don't want you to know. <laughs> Okay, Jason Zola and Williams, Matt Zola and Cabral, Don Zola and Williams. Oh, I'm sorry. That's right. You're right on this down. Matt and then who? Uh, Don with Zola and Williams. Jim is Zola and Sutton. And Rita with Zola and Sutton. So there's a tie. So you have another tie. Um, yeah. Miss Zola was the highest with five. So she would get the 2021 seat. And then you have a tie between Williams and Sutton. So we're voting between Williams and Sutton. Correct. Okay. For the one year. Matt Sutton, Jason Williams, Don Williams, Sutton, uh, sorry, Jim Sutton, and Rita Sutton. Sutton. So Sutton gets it three votes. Okay, I'm the last one, Government Study Committee. One seat, oh, two applicants, right. Catherine Stover and okay. Curtis Barnes. Catherine Stover and? Curtis Barnes. And Curtis Barnes. The one without the name is me again, no, sorry. The no name. <laughs> I'm a slow learner. Okay. 
Jim Barnes, Rita Barnes, Don Barnes, Jason Barnes, and Matt Barnes. That's all of them. I believe that's it for votes. Mm -hmm. Agenda. Okay, we're going to move committee reports to the end of the meeting. Now we're on to consent items. We have six of these, number four and number six have been tabled. So we have one, two, three, and five. Um, is there any, do we want to do a blanket vote on these? Do we want to go by one by one? It's the pleasure of the board. Um, I think motion. Agenda, unless there are questions. Sometimes there's a question every once in a while. I make a motion to approve all five. Or okay. all all three. All, all, uh, all four. All four. four. All four. four. Three, four, two, three. Yeah. Second that. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Is that aye, Matt? Yeah. All those. So that's unanimous. Okay, we're on to citizen department request uh, for the assessor request for endorsement of the Bateman Advisory Committee of Second. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 That motion passes unanimously. Okay, the next uh, one is a planning office request for execution of purchase and sale agreement, temporary license agreement to allow construction on, on Dartmouth Lane. Um, Andrew, thank you. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Do we have the map? Yeah. Or, sorry. So the board had, um, th this is a, a paper street called Dartmouth Lane, which goes between Derrymore and Delaney. And um, this particular section is the northern side uh, of a parcel that we've already dealt with. Um, you can see it outlined in the yellow, uh, or the uh, highlighted section there. Uh, it would go to the adjacent owner to the north. Um, that owner has received permission uh, to divide that property um, without the uh, inclusion of that particular paper street. This allows, um, uh, this matter is stuck in land court like so many of the other ones. Um, and this allows him to do some initial work um, on that property and basically the purchase and sale allows him to seek the direct approval from land bank, I mean land court, I'm sorry. Um, which actually takes a burden away from the key here from calling them all the time and, and figuring it out. The long-term plan for that road, as you can see, is the neighbors did not want that to become a through road. So I would ask the board to um, move ahead and... Uh, how, is it, how is it less of a burden if you do it now? Is it rolled up in the land court or what do you mean by that? Uh, the burden is seeking the land court approval. Um, the license expires once we actually do the transfer. Uh, and what is, again, this sort of not a, a distinct set of rules, like it goes to the land court and 30 days goes by and then something is approved. It's taking a long time to process all of these. Um, am I overstating it or understating? So, so in the instances of most of these yard sales that end up in land court, um, what's happened is they're registered land. We file a plan that's on the recorded land side. So we then have to create a parcel on the registered land side in order for it to be actually allows us to have a um, certificate of title put into the town's name. And then we could then go ahead and sell the property to the property owner. Um, because of the process, we end up having to have these plans created, file them with the land court, then it sits there. For, it, it sits there for literally. It can sit there for several months, um, and then we file petitions to have um, a certificate put into the name of the town. This process has taken several years on some people's part um, for us to be able to get this through. So um, this enables um, this property owner to be able to, um, you know, actually put in some utilities in what would be Dartmouth Lane. And, um, and then proceed to do his subdivision of his property um, while we're waiting for the land court approval, which again can take, it could take another year, you know, for all I know. So, um, you know, this will enable him to go ahead and proceed with the subdivision. 
Okay. Mm -hmm. and, and just to clarify, Vicky or Andrew, that he's required to put the utilities in this area um, of land? I think that was part of the subdivision plan approval was mm -hmm. to put the utilities in there. So mm -hmm. he's going to be, um, he has the, the town is going to be granting him a license to be able to install these utilities. Mm -hmm. He can't put any other structures in there. He can only put the structure, the utility lines that are shown similar to the plan. Mm -hmm. um, so. I make a motion that we approve the request. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 That, mo that motion passes unanimously. Okay, on the public hearings, we have A through E. And we will we to open a public hearing for each one individually. Just no, I think we can do it. Okay, so we're going to open a public hearing as a group. For the group. Okay. So um, we're asking you to move forward on parcel C, D, and E. So parcel A, we're at. We're going to withdraw that completely. Parcel B, we need to continue that, and we would suggest to your September meeting. And then we're ready to move forward on parcels um, C, D, and E, if you would um, vote to approve those takings. Um, just briefly, this is clearing the title to land that's in the name of the town. So um, it, it's in the name, but not actually because of some prior mistakes that were made. Um, again, this is land court property, so again, we have some corrective actions to do. Thank you. Questions, comments? So we're, we're, we're taking and not disposing at this time. We're, yes. I move approval. Anybody from the public? public I'm sorry, comment? it's open. Can you, so when you do a motion, Okay. Okay. Is there anyone here in the public like to speak on these? Right, which ones are closed? Okay, we'll close the public hearing. Well, don't we want to continue? Oh, I'm oh. sorry, Jim. Do we yeah. want to continue the item B until the September board meeting? Can we do that before we? Yeah. Make a motion to do that. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. The motion passes. And I make a motion to. Approve items C, D, and E. Second. Did you close the public hearing? Oh. Okay. Sorry? Did you close the public hearing? I did close the public hearing. Okay. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. And then B's table. Correct. B is continue. Continue. Okay. And town manager's report. All right. We've got reviewing the potential warrant articles for the October 10th special town meeting. There's a note in the packet um, on this. Okay, so both <laughs> They'll catch up. Carry on. They'll catch up. All right. <laughs> they can watch the tape. <laughs> yeah. But maybe we get it done before they get back. Yeah. Um, we've got, uh, so the, as we know, the reason we called the special in the first place was primarily for marijuana zoning and or general bylaw amendments. There's in our, uh, memo attached from town council that sort of outlines the various options that the board might want to consider. And they include ban, limitation, zoning changes. I think planning is, planning board is working on some zoning bylaw recommendations and some general bylaw recommendations potentially. Um, we're also looking at some other bylaws in the town code that may or may not impact some of us. So at some point, we're going to need direction from the board on what articles should be developed. Planning board is going to be talking about that on July 9th at its meeting. And we will have town council here at our meeting on July 11th. If the board wanted to have any discussion tonight, I know it's getting late uh, and all, but it would be a little helpful to have some direction on what articles we want to start developing. We also have a number of financial articles. We have the infrastructure improvements connected to Old South Road and the infrastructure improvements connected to Milestone Road. And as you recall, we split that into two, as I just mentioned, from the annual at which it was one article for Old South Road improvements, passed the town meeting, failed at the ballot. So you, you recently voted to split that into two, as shown. Some other financial articles have come up. I don't think any of them are overly controversial. 
We are likely to need supplemental funds for the C Street pump station renovation project. Um, that's, I think, weather related um, in general. And there would, I think, be sewer retained earnings to potentially cover that, as well as maybe some expansion of SRF funding. We'd like to put in design and engineering for a new sewer force main from C Street to Surfside. We talked about this over the course of the winter and the sewer break. We have a couple of airport projects, um, a project reappropriation and a grant funded project that's come up since we were talking about a special town meeting. And we have a couple of potential fiscal 19 budget amendments. One may or may not have to do with the school, which could be potentially be covered by a likely chapter 70 state aid increase. And the other may be general fund and enterprise fund debt service budget amendments. And more to follow on that, those are still being discussed. We're likely to need ballot questions. Um, don't know yet about marijuana, depending on the direction of the board, but the Old South and Milestone projects would be debt exclusions. And depending on, uh, we've discussed this before, depending on, on what you wanna do, those could potentially go on the November ballot, but we need to know that before August 1st, because we have to notify the Secretary of State's office by August 1st. Um, so, that's pretty much where we are. This, the citizen articles, if any, are due this Friday at 4. When so did we, the warrant open? Um, for citizen articles tomorrow? Well, tomorrow technically, but really citizens can submit them okay. almost any time. We're hoping that they would adhere to the deadline of Friday at 4 to submit. You know, something comes in on Monday, is it? It's not. I thought we had a pretty hard deadline. It's a hard, it is deadline. A hard deadline. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> but that would that would be at our that would be at our pleasure if we wanted to. Correct. No. Have we ever done that? Yes. Four p.m. on Fridays. Oh, have we ever extended it? Um, we haven't extended the deadline, but we have put in articles later of our so, own of our own citizen articles of our own volition later. Yes. That you've decided to that we that we support. It become select board. Articles, or you might have put them in for them. I mean, we'd have to as a courtesy for yeah. another department. We've done that before, not, not regularly. Yeah. Any questions? Or, comments? Yeah. Uh, just a comment on the because uh, I don't remember talking about it, but the design engineering for the new f sewer force main. Mm -hmm. You know, it, um, I think it's a good idea to do it now while the memory of the storm and the issue is fresh in everyone's mind mm -hmm. so okay thank you good on the on the marijuana stuff i think there's a lot of good suggestions in here you know public consumption bylaws and other issues in here you know i would hope that you know are we going to get a recommendation or from staff or are we going to be are we going to be picking and choosing, and what's the process for doing that? You're going to get recommendations from planning. Um, I, town administration isn't planning to give you any particular recommendation. I think some of this, like the ban or the limitation, those are really policy issues that you ought to think about, and you had different groups in here talking about it over the past month or so. Uh, I don't know if planning is leaning towards anything in particular. I, um, I don't, I think the the limitation issue is going to be with you all specifically and the, and the zoning as far as expanding zoning or retracting zoning or whatever, that's, that's probably going to come in the form of a recommendation from planning. And we're going to have this um, discussion when? July 11th. July 11th. We'll have, I think I heard you say town council. Yeah. Mr. Chairman, through you. So, just to let you know, I mean, and Erica was at present at the meeting, thank you for your input as well. Um, I think it's fair to say that the planning board feels, um, you know, wants to follow the direction from you all. I think if you're recommending the two uh, retail, I think that the board feels that's appropriate. Um, I think the board is not willing to entertain additional locations at this time um, outside of the, um, CN and the CI district for at least retail. Uh, I think there's a discussion about the craft cooperatives and some of the 
separating some of the, um, the ability to grow the, um, the marijuana by smaller entities. That is at least going to come up for discussion. Um, and we were working with Cadia Town Council to give us some uh, advice, as well as um, reviewing local bylaws that have passed in other towns. So um, we don't have a, a draft bylaw yet, but um, Planning Board will be discussing it in detail on the 9th. If you all want to send in group comments or you want to attend that, that would be great. Yeah, it kind of kept coming up the discussion about whether the zoning should be any different for the cultivation. Mm -hmm. Right, and I, I will say that the board did have a discussion about, I, mean, I don't think there is really support for that located downtown in, in the commercial downtown district. I've, I've heard some comments on that, and I, I don't think there's support at the, at the board level for that. Again, if you all have different opinions, I'd love to hear I, that. Um, not for downtown. For, I think, uh, are you talking about cultivation as opposed to retail? Retail. Yeah, and I think Don was talking about I was talking cultivation. about cultivation. Oh, sorry. sorry yeah, no, th there's just been some questioning of could the zoning be different for the cultivate cultivation only for yeah. growing? Yes, and it could, and it could also have things like limits, mm -hmm. like only X number of special permits could be issued. or so There's, there's also size, like there's tiers that the state puts on in terms of volume right. that you're allowed to grow. Mm -hmm. And less than... It's less than 5,000, which is about the can't. I mean, it gets very technical. So, so one of my concerns, the more uh, public forums that I go to, the more articles I read, the Cannabis Control Commission Chairman Steve Hoffman, listening to him, uh, who knows, but what if the feds open this up and then anything can come over in four years, three years, six years? How do we keep this local? How do we keep the jobs here? How do we keep it? grown here and where it's not, you know, I don't even know if we can stop this, but the, the big money and the big tobacco, you've always said, Matt, how can we hold it off as long as possible? If, you know, is there ways to do that with zoning to allow them to be successful? I, I, I don't. I'm not sure. I'm not sure there is because, you know, we give it to someone and they're a local or they're, you know, a nice group and we really like them and they get an offer they can't refuse from a, from a big conglomerate, we're done. You know, it, there's not, we can't stop it. And I think that's the, you know, that's the reality of what's going on. There's, a, there's tons of this happening and there's a consolidation, but it's not going the way that sort of the advocates envisioned. It, it, this is just trying to do that. Well, Mass is trying to do it, but, but, but they, they say they are, but then their zoning went to all the rich white guys and, and, and they locked up the locations and they put a hat in Boston. They put, you know, a radius around it. And so the guys with the money all got it. So, so they really, you know, there's, a, there's the intention and then there's a the reality. And I, I think, you know, so I think we have to realize we're not going to, if, you know, there's, there are hedge funds and there's, you know, there's big money going into this right now. This is the next big thing. And, and it's, you know, it's, it's going to steamroll across the country. I think you're absolutely right about that. Um, a question I would have, and I don't know if, Andrew, you know the answer. If you, Jason, if it came up at the meetings, Don, that um, you went to, is that my only question about that is if at the state level or when we issue a license, there is this local preference. In, if they then were to get, if the business got bought out in five years' time, is it still a condition of the license renewing that there'd have to be some local presence? Like, I'm just not sure how, if there's that local preference restriction tied to the license and the license renewal, if they could get bought out. The same way. It's my understanding that we've only had any control in the host, the, the, the host agreement, the HCA. So are you saying that? In, um, the camp, my understanding is that the Cannabis Control Commission has a local. You have to be a Massachusetts resident for 12 months right. in order to get the license to apply for the license in the first place. So your concerns about them getting bought out in five years' time mm -hmm. is that relevant? If there, if that still exists. Like can you renew the license? If they get bought out, do you renew the license? Even though there's I think we would have control in the host community that's agreement. It, that's where really? we can say, you know what, we don't feel comfortable. But you'd have a but you'd have a hard you you'd that. be up against someone with a lot of money and a lot of lawyers and they'd start mm -hmm. talking interstate commerce and and rights and, and other things and we'd have a very difficult time, I think, saying, you know, you're you, we don't like you, but we like them. I, I just you know, I, I think it's I don't think that we should assume that we're going to be able to control who owns it 
for very long. I think we're going to, it's, it's sort of like, you know, a market rate house. You know, you, they decide to sell, they sell to whoever they sell to. But if they so, sell, can we still make sure that it's grown here and jobs are here? And I don't think, maybe that's this end. I don't know. That, well, that's, that's why I would love to see it not allowed to go back and forth on the boat. Right. You know, but. Right. This is a, it, only if, if yeah. um, the feds change the. But, you know, Andrew, Andrew, can you, can you, can we, you know, he might be able to answer whether we can say you can't bring it from elsewhere in the bylaw. Yeah, there's, there is some, um, I'm thinking of what Katie had produced for us, and I know that there is a way to put something about uh, local, local businesses, so we'll look at that. I know the craft, I mean, I mean, the cooperative, it's, it's important to understand they have to sell to a retailer. They can't sell directly to the public. Yeah. So that's one of one of the important things there. So, but I, I think once you have the bylaw, and we will definitely look at that issue. Is there anything uh, that you guys are looking at, for example, having the cultivation or or, or product manufacturing in SeaTech or another area? Um, I think there was, at least from the initial discussion by the board, the there was a little bit of resistance to that. Mm -hmm. um, that it's moving too much of it maybe into areas that are residential. Um, SeaTech is uh, an area that allows single family and commercial. Um, again, that's it's not final at this point. Um, I think there was some pretty much uh, agreement that it should not share the same space as residential space. And that is a recommendation, I think, but from the fire chiefs that that those not be co-located together. And I think that makes sense. Mm -hmm. um, the, the argument for that I found interesting, and I met with a, um, a local person today about growing outside versus inside, is what was interesting about the energy use, um, that the inside growers use a lot of uh, energy, and those might tend to be more the national uh, companies as opposed to local growers, which is an interesting idea. So, Was there a clarification of whether inside was, say, in a container versus in a greenhouse? Is a greenhouse considered inside? I guess it is. Um, well, I, I guess a greenhouse would be sort of the agricultural subset mm -hmm. where the, the, the facility itself, which has to be air conditioned and heated on, all that. Okay. So, so yes, the greenhouse is sort of the agricultural, localized kind of effort. You've been interested in the co-op. Well, but based on the questions that I've been asked, it seems like there is a lot of interest in the, the co-op or sort of the collective. And it seems like there are a lot of small growers that don't necessarily want to have the, um, the burden of the actual business themselves, Testing but just small growers, yeah. yeah as well as being approached about the possibility of extending it into the ag agricultural zoning. So um, I had one question, just limiting the number of other types of adult use marijuana establishments, i.e. cultivation product manufacturing. Would we have to uh, specify each one individually? You, you could, that's one of the possibilities that could be included. Okay. It's not necessarily a requirement, but it could be um, you know, we could start out slow and then that can be adjusted. I mean, basically, you know, uh, it can be adjusted either way, basically. But, all right. Um, I'd like us to consider putting something in, even though the state hasn't put up the parameters for home delivery yet uh, um, within our bylaw. I mean, I, I kind of think we should start by prohibiting it, but and go from there once we see what the state approves, but. The, right, and the same I'm applies to concerned social. concerned about how that's gonna function here. Social consumption is the other one that, that again, rules have not been developed yet. Mm -hmm. And from the examples I've seen, most communities do add it in, but it's just listed as prohibited for now. So, so I, think, I think we should preemptively do that, and depending on what the state's time frame is. It could catch us like right in the middle of when we would be having a town meeting. It right. Might, it just right. Might, it might not line up very well to address that. Yep. No, I, I agree 100%. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you. And I do, and I, and I know I'm probably the only one, but maybe I'm not, but I know that there's, there is a bit of a groundswell that, uh, that 
A, I think no matter what we do, we should go very slow. And it's easier to let the, let the reins out than to try to pull them back. And, you know, and we may want to have an option to ban it. I think that there's a groundswell of people who now realize what they're, what this is about. And I, you know, I don't think it's the, you know, it was a feel good vote without people understanding what the implications are. I think more people, the more they look into it, I think there's a little more concern for here. I mean, so, you know, and, and I'm not sure how we, what, what we do, how we place that if we did, even did it, I'm not sure it would get three votes to be on, be put on the ballot from this board, but I think that we at least should discuss it okay. and where to put it. So you guys know where I stand. I haven't really been really vocal. I've really tried to have an open mind and listen for this last year and four months and come looking at it. I'm for um, limiting it to two. I don't want to ban it because I don't think it'll pass. And then it's wild, wild west. That's what makes me nervous. And then I don't like one for the kind of monopoly side of it. I think I think they're going to have to work together to be successful. With these two businesses and growing. And I think one wouldn't. Um, we have a monopoly, and I don't think all the people I've talked to in the industry, you would have two successful, and a third one would just keep coming. If, if we limited it to three, it, the third one wouldn't be successful. Um, so I am right now taking the position of I want to limit it to two. That's where I'm at right now. If we can get clarification, because Steve Hoffman, the, the CCC guy, made me question about the 20% that we would, it would have to go to a ballot for two. When our town council said only zero or one, we have to go to a ballot because we rounded up. So the way he said it made me, I wasn't so sure. Um, so if I could just maybe get an, another layer of clarification that if we limit it to two, it would have to go to a ballot. Yeah, I thought that would just went to town meeting. I think it's just a, it's just a general bylaw, right? And then all the zoning. Okay, if it's not a ballot, then I'm for, for two. Um. Uh. You know, I, I think there's, uh, uh, I mean, this is still a, I don't know, it's social policy, it's health policy, um, and I think it's okay to uh, consider taking the temperature of the community about things like this um, uh, from time to time, um, and, um, you know, I'm, I'm less concerned about the success, the financial success of these organizations, personally. I don't know, I don't feel a, you know, a need to link the, um, the number to what might be financially viable. Um, I'm personally more interested in restricting access. Um, and, and you know, you've heard me share my concerns about it. I, I'm very much, uh, in tune with what the uh, school school superintendent uh, said, um, and uh, so I think we should have a conversation about Matt's idea of what. Ben? But uh, I, you know, yeah, I was saying give the give, we may want to consider giving the the public the opportunity to do that, and I and I agree with you that it, it might blow up, but that blows up then it's the opposite. Well, no, well. Hoping. No, if it blows up, then we go to step two, which is, we, you know, we do your, what you're talking about, you know, in the town meeting. We don't have to have only one article. You can have more than one article. It's a ballot initiative. Isn't that, isn't that mm -hmm. complicated? Who would that be on the next annual town meeting? It would be a, it would be a ballot. ballot. Mm -hmm. right. If you were talking about a ban you'd need a special election following the special tell meeting. Can't go on the November ballot. And if the ban failed, then there's no ban. What I'm not totally sure about is how you'd logistically have a backup plan. But what I'm saying, well, what if you had two articles and you had a ban and you also had what? A limitation. A limitation of two, of one or two. And they both pass town meeting, and you go to the ballot and the bat and and the you know because we if we vote at town meeting the one or two is is the law once we vote it correct mm -hmm. and then so we go to do the van and the ban doesn't pass we still have the law we just voted correct and I, I, I'm just trying to frame the conversation for the eleventh I, I think it's important to have town council here 
<laughs> to answer the what ifs and the procedures and that kind of stuff. But um, yeah, I know we're not taking a vote tonight. Yeah, I know we're not, but I'm just I'm asking yeah. that question because we're right. because we're going to want to have clarity of that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Because you do, you know I don't I'm not suggesting an all or nothing situation. Right. But I'm also you know I'm also uh, I'm cognizant of you know of friends who have had you know children who have been very severely impacted by this. I'm cognizant of what's happening in other areas with sort of health issues, and you know I'm cognizant of our you know party atmosphere that we're fostering. And so I just think there's a combination of things that people you know that a good amount number of people feel strongly about. You party, know, party atmosphere is something that. I do. Yeah, I think it's a serious concern. And, you know, and this all started as medical marijuana. Mm -hmm. now, this was going to be, this you know, wasn't recreational. This is really going to help people. And we have all kinds of studies that have showed it. But Monday, for the first time, the FDA approved a, um, a medication, um, CBD-based uh, medication uh, for, uh, that, uh, for uh, that's proven to be shown efficacious for medical treatment. Epilepsy in this case, it has no. It doesn't get you high. Um, it has uh, so whether, um, and that's the only one there's been. Um, now it still has to go. You know, the DEA has to figure out what what does this mean because marijuana is still a class one um, substance, whatever, uh, along with uh, LSD and heroin. So uh, that that debate will ensue, but. Uh, I think that's just an interesting fact that ties in with some of our conversation about medical marijuana. Our first letter of non-opposition was to a medical-only establishment, which our second letter was to a medical-only establishment that now wants to be recreational. The first one's grandfathered. So, you know, so this, you know, that's the, that's what's going to happen no matter who it is. You know, the money, and when you look at the setup of these operations, there's a small space for the medical and there's a big counter for everything else. And that's where the money's going to be made, you know, so, and fair enough, you know, they're in business and fair enough, but you know, we, I feel as though it's been a little bit of a, you know, we've been a little bit of a bait and switch, you know, we're here to do medical. We really want to help you, but so. That's why I want to get ahead of the social consumption oh, and 100%. The home delivery before. So the, we can take our time on that. Yes. Um, yeah, I, th I think our, our big questions are, do we propose a ban, which I've been against because the community voted for this, but I still have some questions on, did people just want to grow their own or did they really want to shop? Um, but it does, it, it did hit home with me what the, what the superintendent had to say. You know, just, it's just the, it'll, it'll, become more normal just like people have bottles of wine and beer in their fridge that their teenagers yeah. might go and take when they're at, when they're out you know it it just it it can it could it, it can spiral into things where it's just it, it becomes so normal that kids have more access to it and there are a lot of studies of how detrimental it is to anybody who's under like the age of 25 in terms of their development Especially us, uh, us guys, because we develop slower, so <laughs> it can really mess us up. I think, it, I think the cutoff is 50 for men. So. <laughs> <laughs> Any other comments on that uh, Yeah, just to, to chime in, I'm, um, I'd be very hesitant to uh, vote put, to put a ban on. I haven't heard the ground swell of opposition for a straight-out ban. I've definitely heard some of the fears about the what-ifs, and I think going slowly is important and maintaining the controls that we set good policy. But I think without further, further feedback or evidence of the community really wanting to consider the ban, I feel like it would be a bait and switch because for me, part of the moratorium was to look at the, how we would um, set the zoning and how it would create the policy not to then throw out the possibility of a ban. Um, so without that, I, I wouldn't be in favor of it at this stage, but I do understand the concerns. I'm more supportive of the idea of a limitation mm -hmm. so that there aren't like five trying to open at once. I yeah. think it would be just too overwhelming for the community. And to clarify, I, I would be very supportive of a limitation. And I thought, Jason, your, your point was reasonable. 
And I, I think it would be, again, I think the community to me seems reasonable and they also seem to uh, want to have it local as well. So I think a lot of our concerns in terms of the limitation and, and the keeping it local are being echoed in the community. So if we can find ways to do that through the bylaws and the zoning, then that would be ideal. Now, I don't see it as a bait and switch at all. To me, it's a, okay, community, this is your last chance. You voted this way. Are you really sure? These are the consequences. We spent a lot of time as a board discussing it, pros and cons. The Board of Health has discussed it. The planning board's discussed it. We've had a community conversation. We've had forums. We've had experts. Uh, and, you know, what's, what, what, say, what say ye now? So... Uh, do you feel like I wasn't able to go to the public outreach, but was that something that came up? No, um, I thought it was more people were trying to be more informed, they have questions, mm -hmm. there was things both sides. Um, the last one we went to at the Nantucket Inn, there was a lot of people that were interested in kind of the, the co-op side of it, mm -hmm. how to grow it, can we change the zoning, yeah. why did you start this? It, could it be a citizen article? If there are people that are concerned, is that something that could be a citizen article? Yeah. In, in what manner do you mean as a citizen? As yeah. in, could someone propose there's a ban to, to ban? They could probably, and they, they could also, they could propose to expand the zoning. Mm -hmm. You know, they, I think citizens can do whatever they want. And, and then we would have to have a special election. Or how does that work if it's a citizen article? Do you it depends what the article is. Yeah. Right. Yeah. We'd really have to see the article. I think the you know, get a lit litmus test of the people, you can also do that by limit it to two and see if they pass that general bylaw. And people will say the same thing. I just I just think banning is just not the not the way to go. It's too risky. Um, sixty what is it? We all in agreement, said three percent said yes. Do they really know what they were voting for? We don't know. We just know that 63% said yes. That's what we do know. Yep. The registered voters. Oh, registered voters, yes, you always correct me on that. Sorry, the votes cast. The votes cast, 6,500 out of 9,200 9, voters. I've also had friends who have grown for years, not that they're supposed to, but, you know, and they've said, hey, I don't mind if it never happens here, because now at least I'm growing and I'm not going to get in trouble. And, you know, so the, so the whole local idea, you know, if we if we really are concerned about local, we allow those guys to grow and keep doing what they're doing, and they don't get in trouble. And, you know, but when you what, what I worry about from the local standpoint is you bring in someone and they open up on Amelia Drive and or wherever, you know, somewhere in SeaTech, and they're doing a they do a bang up business and they're doing you know X zillion a year, whatever it is, and then they're bought out, and and then the boats are legal, and all of a sudden it's coming over and. You know, it, I just think it's not like if we want a craft thing, that's kind of you, you keep it as small as you can without the opportunity to have it have it bought out by, you know, by the you know, the hedge fund money, the big guys, you know. So but I, you know, that's that's you know, that's my sustainable Nantucket, you know, hat on. And, you know, I'd rather see the money stay here. You know, I'd rather see it circulate through our own economy rather than be siphoned right off the island. And I agree, that's where my first questions were for Andrew and Rita, how we try to keep it all here yeah. as long as possible. Yeah, we do a lot better. Every dollar spent here circulates five, six, seven times here. You know, every dollar we spend with someone that ships it off island, it's gone. Well, maybe there are more provisions. If we're only doing two licenses, maybe there are more provisions that we can put in those licenses to ensure that they're non-transferable. I think looking at every way to keep it craft and local. Yeah. It's like it's a good question for Katie on the eleventh, as Jim has said. That's a, yeah, that's a that's a good idea. I'd support one, maybe two if it were if we could find some way to guarantee that the guys here are gonna benefit. Not, you know, I would be more in, I'd be more likely to support it, even though I think it's not necessary, and it could harm our harm us. But you know, I, I sat with uh, Libby and Andrew and Town Council, and we went through a term sheet for host community, and it's really, really detailed. I think going through that and reading it again, I feel just a little more comfortable of how 
structured and strenuous it's going to be for them to be successful. It's pretty controlled. I know there's, there's, there's things that we don't know yet, the unintended consequences, but we're all a little, that's why I want to go slow as well. Okay, any other comments, thoughts on um, any other articles? Any you need on those? Like oh, right. comments. Am I, I, get, I just one other. Uh, <coughs> I, if, on these, I still think, I still strongly think we need to model the traffic changes so that if we're, if we go to town meeting and we want to do this and that roundabout, I think we need to be able to say, when we do this, here's what it's going to do in these other areas. And we, you know, I know it's possible. We did it 25 years ago with the crappy computers and the little white dots that they had then. I'm sure it's a lot better today. And some of the concerns that people have expressed to me are that we don't, they don't want to spend money on these to just have the traffic back up everywhere else. So we need to look at, you know, we need to model it and see to be able to, if we want to have these things pass. You know. and, we, and we need to make sure Richmond's money's in the bank. <laughs> I didn't say that. I didn't. Okay, moving on to committee reports. You want to get anything good? Um, I do. Um, as I hinted at earlier, we had our second affordable housing trust um, strategic planning session, which was excellent, and we're getting closer and closer to a final product, and we're still pushing. We've added a meeting in August so that we can have something by the end of August, our final plan. Not something. It'll be our final. Oh, should we take that? The final plan. And, you know, I just wanted to reiterate that, um, uh, well, I suppose we've really been looking very closely at the existing partnerships as well as partnerships that we can potentially form going forward that we're not currently availing of. And I think I've tried to make it clear that I think that understanding our role and how the select board can best support the Affordable Housing Trust, I feel that is still a very new and emerging relationship. So that's one that I'd like to see us really take up as, as this plan becomes more clear. Um, and also one of the 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 regular meeting items was the comment to the ZBA. And just to reiterate that the concerns from the Affordable Housing Trust were the density and Brooke Moore brought up um, looking at ways to incentivizing to reduce the density. And if there's any way to really work with the developers to reduce that density, um, ways to ensure more affordability. And Linda Williams made an excellent point and it came up a little bit in discussion tonight about the 40 Bs that um, she's concerned about the negative impact on the perception of affordable housing and how we keep having these big 40 Ps, Bs, um, give 40 B a, a horrible name and give a, really not help with the image of affordable housing. So I thought that was a really um, an excellent point and one to keep in mind, particularly as we try and do more public outreach um, with affordable housing issues. So that was it. Thank you. Anything else? Libby? I just want to mention some things that are coming up at your July 11th oh, yes. meeting. Thank you. Uh, the special town meeting again, mm -hmm. as you know. We are going to have the Green Lady Host Community Agreement draft for the board to review. Um, you'll have a term sheet for that and some other documents, and we'll be trying to get that out to you ahead of time. We've got the 2019 annual town meeting timeline. We have an all department or pertinent department water quality update. It's an annual thing we've been giving to you. And then the final Surfside 40B letter so far. Thank you. I just had to, uh, real quick. We, oh, go ahead. No, go ahead. I figured you were going to adjourn. Most to adjourn. No, 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 I have a comment. I have a committee report. You have a committee report. So well, I'm just going to do that. We, we met for the audit committee okay, go a little earlier this year. Is that your comment? No. Okay. <laughs> and uh, we have the finance director FinCom chair, and just to, just to start the conversation on enterprise funds, do we, do we want to take solid waste on our home out of enterprise for them oper operating? And what are the benefits? What does that look like? So we had a nice 30, 45 minute discussion on on that. So that was there was no decide anything, but it was interesting to have see what all the whole ramifications of that would be or not. So I think it's only unique that I have. And, and mine is a comment um, in the for the past few years on an annual basis, usually in June, in executive session, we have reviewed um, cases, lawsuits, claims against the town. Um, and that's been a 
real educational process for me, and I'd encourage us to continue to do that. And so. Now you made me thought to give another comment on yours, Rita, on the kind of framing the debate and the words labeling affordable housing, how it's getting a negative connotation to it. It switches for me when I, I got an email from Ann Kutzba from you know, the housing, right? Um, you know, about Peter Brace. And it was his whole story of how long, 20 years of him renting, and he finally got a covenant home. Mm -hmm. And when you put a face on it and you see people like Peter Brace, it's like, okay, affordable housing, community housing is a good thing. And so we kind of got to remember that and tell those stories, whether it's Sachem's Path or a covenant program or, or something else that we don't talk about a lot. Yeah. So I agree, 40 Bs take affordable housing. Um, Faceless. I think we do forget who we really are trying to meet the needs for. Um, and it really is a commitment, at least from the Affordable Housing Trust, to a commitment to a diverse, socially diverse community. Um, and I also want to just say as well that um, Ann Kuspa and Housing Nantucket came up many times when we looked at the partnerships that we have. And I just want to say that, again, in what sometimes seems like a lonely endeavor, that Housing Nantucket is doing a lot um, to help. So. Anything else? I mean, just in, in that regard, I think that we have to, that we've got to be thinking, uh, you know, on the housing issue outside the box a little bit. And one of the things that people sort of said strongly 20 years ago is that it should be sort of, we should find incentives and ways to encourage it around the island. It shouldn't be in, you know, in single pockets or, you know, and, and so there's got to, you know, we've got, you know, it's not necessarily just the traditional ways isn't how it's going to be solved. Yeah. So I agree. I got to end on one another positive. The lines that were drawn, um, is it Candle Street, where the National Grid property is, where you get up where fresh is. So I walk that every day. And just because one line was drawn, bikes and people walk there and the trucks and the cars stay right in the middle. It's just so Funny how whatever that labor and that paint cost versus trying to like get easements or put a sidewalk in there, just that simple line has changed that entire movement of people. I just wanted to say thank you to DPW, those little things that they're doing works. So. Yeah, I noticed that the other day. It's amazing. Standard walk. It's, a, it's like a bike lane now. Yeah, everybody's, yeah. the cars stay perfectly in line. They, there's yeah. five feet there now. Yeah. Thank you for that. And uh, I have a baby to feed in 30 minutes, so is there a motion to adjourn? <laughs> Motion to adjourn. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. What time? Erica, everybody fill this way.